So a little Irby. So like he, they bought a whale and then it's got white walls on it. Yeah. So they bought a whale <laughs> that was inside this trailer and hauled this whale all over the country. An actual whale, an actual whale. Was and it called little Irvy? It was called little Irvy. <laughs> but then he, he, and so he wound up building these other trucks because that truck, more people wanted to look at the truck. And they wanted to look at the whale that was inside the well, truck. What are you doing with the whale? <laughs> was the whale yeah, see, alive? It says it on the 20 ton, 20 ton, 38 foot whale, and whale inside. See the giant from the Pacific. Wow. It's like a stuffed whale? Oh, you you got to understand. it might have been stuffed. But entertainment I, I was a little different back yeah, then. But, yeah, that's Kids not, didn't have Instagram. You're going to go out and see a whale. If <laughs> <back> when, <laughs> Little <laughs> Irvy's coming to town, you're going to line up in back, the Kmart parking lot to see it. <laughs> back when Josh and I were little era. kids, that was our Netflix. That was entertainment. Huh? They let's didn't look, even know what the Joey Chitwood experience was let's about. Look, we let's Little Irvy and chill. Me and Phil were playing Super Nintendo, and you guys are looking at Little Irvy. Welcome to Oil and Whiskey, an Ironclad Original. I am Josh Henning. I'm Phil Gerber. I'm Jeremy Gerber. Welcome to Oil and Whiskey, an Ironclad Original. Today's guest is automotive photographer John Jackson. But first, it's time for On the Gas. In this segment, we want to take some time to shout out an individual vendor, shop, or company that's got their foot on the gas, doing great work, and taking their projects and industry to the next level. However, when we have an in-studio guest like we do today, we like to give them the opportunity to give a shout out to somebody that's on the gas. So, John, who do you have? Uh, so, this is one that I just recently photographed with, and it's Kent Waters Originals oh, out sure. of Georgia. And uh, it was hard to nail it down to just one because, luckily, Andy Leach threw Randy from Paint House out, and I think <laughs> Randy's one of the most underrated painters on the planet. But uh, I went to Kent Waters, and what got me with Kent was the work he has coming not just the work he's done, because I'm obviously you've seen the 56 that yep. used to be George's that he redid for his customer. And then he had the Willys that was uh, also at Shades of the Past, the gasser. And then the guy who owns the gasser has an awesome Jaguar with LS power and a handmade wide body on it. That's oh, wow. going to be pretty awesome. Yeah, it's... Yeah, Ken's a good dude. Yeah, Ken is a great nice guy. He's got a couple, so, and I just recently, couple RS chassis. Yep. Yeah, he's got yep. a good bit of Yeah, he's got a lot of cool, really cool, awesome stuff coming. Like, because he runs that line of show car race car really well and yeah. i just don't think he's gotten and it's not that he even wants it he doesn't got get the appreciation that he deserves i think because he has his you know group of customers and he's building cars for them and um that's all that really matters to him he doesn't you know the instagram facebook none of that stuff he just gets to build his car for his customers and he's perfectly happy with that yep. yeah so. I, I never met him one of these yeah. days i'd like to meet i love the something about the name yeah it's there's like a mystique yeah. about it Kent Waters Originals. Yeah, it's a good name. Say that a couple of times. Let's see how that rolls off the tongue. It Why sounds, don't you guys work that into a jingle? Maybe? Yeah, it sounds good. <laughs> it would be I'd good for it. a jingle. Yeah. Yeah. As good as Jason Graham? Yeah. No, I don't I don't know. That was the first <laughs> and only jingle we did for a shop, and that one went nowhere. I haven't talked to Jason I think he since. Un, I think he unfriended me I think Facebook. he did. <laughs> yeah. It was a good jingle. Hey, you win some, you lose some. Yeah. I've listened to every episode. Oh, have you? All but one. You're that guy. Yeah. We've had, we've got <laughs> our customer. Hey, I was, I was your <laughs> first only one. Spotify yeah. review. Really? Yeah. Thanks, I gave you guys dude. one star. Not just awesome. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, two years later, it's like still hurt. Yeah. I, I know these assholes and they suck just yeah. as much on air as they do in, in person. Well, that should be five stars then, right? Because it's not fake. Yeah. The same I, I suppose, asshole in person as yeah. I am on the podcast. Yeah. Uh, John Jackson is the owner of Not Stock Photography based out of Houston, Texas. Whether it was riding shotgun in his grandfather's big rig, working on his own cars, or as a member of Alan Colwicky's NASCAR pit crew. I did not know that until I read yeah. that. That's really cool. Uh, John has always been involved in the industry. Currently, John lives in his Mercedes RV, home wrecker, and travels the country documenting auto shops, events, the best builds, and anything related to the custom car scene. Not Stock Photography has been featured in numerous publications like Street Trucks, The Riders Journal, Good Guys Gazette, Fuel Curve, and many, many more. Make sure to check out his work at NotStockPhotography.com. Subscribe to his YouTube channel at NotStockPhoto. You can also keep up with him on the Instagram at NotStockPhoto. John Jackson, welcome to Oil & Whiskey. So I'm a longtime listener, first-time caller. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. I was waiting until we got to that. So tell us your face, Glad to have John. you. <laughs> <laughs> like love line yeah. <laughs> uh it's good to have you in person man we've been this is when we've been talking about for a while i know you're uh, a busy busy man all over the country so i'm glad we could get this one worked out oh it's not not a big deal um i'm 
actually kind of shocked and honored because I, my whole business is based off of guys like you building cool stuff. And without you guys, I don't have a job. So, you know, I'm just a, a, a peg in the cog or however you want to say it, you know, that, that we all work together and, you know, get to create. So it's, it's nice to be able to come. And actually I got my first tour of the shop today and it's, it doesn't uh, disappoint. It's very awesome. You guys have a beautiful facility. Thank Thanks, you. Appreciate, appreciate and that. everybody was working. I've never been in one of those shops before. <laughs> really? <laughs> what, what time was that? At? Oh, I think it was right before punch out and because okay. Phil was walking through. All right. They were cranking. Yeah. Just rocking Hammering. and rolling yeah. out there. Just making noises. Bang oh, out, I don't know if they were actually building anything. They were making <laughs> noise. Yeah. Yeah, so. uh, well, first off, we need to get, we need to get some whiskey going. Okay. We, so did you, did you bring something? I have a question. So, okay. Going back to an early episode, uh, Texas bourbon was done wrong because one yes. of your staff guys brought Balconis's uh, ZZ Top in. Yeah. And it is yeah. a hideous <clears throat> whiskey that I've had kerosene that tastes better. Yeah, didn't and, get a didn't get yeah. a rave review. Even though yeah. it was gifted to me, I had to give it an honest this sucks. Yep. Yeah. So sorry, Tim. And also in Balconis defense, they were a distiller of the year in 20, 2019 or 2020. So they actually do make a legit good whiskey. Their single barrel is amazing. But 30 miles from my house is uh, Garrison Brothers. Oh, sweet. And so I don't know if you guys have had any Garrison Brothers yet or not. I had a bottle years ago when they were, when they were still doing their, like, blended stuff. When And uh, this was when they first came out. But uh, now they're on to their own yep. batches and stuff. I have not had it. I've got a bottle sitting in my collection. It's been there for years, and I've never opened it because it looks too damn cool. Unopened. So like this that. is the uh, bottle yeah. of Balmeray. Um, I was actually gifted a bottle of this first. Um, and we were at a music concert and outside of Des Moines and me and my buddies were just drinking it out of the bottle. And then the guy <laughs> who gifted it to me, yeah. And the guy who gifted it to me goes, you know, it's a $200 bottle of bourbon, right? And I was like, Oh, well, me and my buddies really <laughs> liked it. Around yeah, the that's fire. why it's so good. <laughs> this is how we get <laughs> and, down. Smooth, and I'm not going to tell you this is going to be a 10, you know, sure. and, and all we just, you drink what you like. You know, yep. It doesn't really matter. So, but I just think that this should give Texas a fair shake. You know, so if it's a six, it's a seven, that's fine. I mean, you won't hurt my feelings. I just wanted Texas to get a good representation. Sure. I mean, Texas um, does most things well, so that, yeah. that wasn't a great representation. Especially with ZZ Top. Well, that's, that's the part. Yeah, that's, that's, I don't know if they earlier. rushed it to the market yeah. and used an early, like, it wasn't aged long enough, maybe. <clears throat> uh, but um, but Garrison Brothers is like 30 minutes from our house. We actually, we're in Burnett, Texas now instead of Houston. Okay. Uh, so we live northwest of Austin about an hour have a nice cool. little house uh, on the lake that my wife bought, and then we can ride our bikes to the Chairlift Access Mountain Bike Trail called Spider Mountain. So that's the whole reason we bought the house there. So yeah, we that's about the motivation, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah we're that's the nice only spot. ones that gain weight riding bicycles because we <laughs> ride to the chairlift, ride to the top, come to the bottom, get a beer, get a taco, ride back to the top, and then go, ah, let's just ride the chairlift. <laughs> and then so we wind up gaining five pounds every time we ride mountain bikes. So. Damn, chairlifts for bikes, huh? Yeah. Oh, it's, it's great. Yeah, not, it not takes excellent. all the worst part of biking, which is riding uphill, completely out of it. And just get to ride downhill from yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, hmm. yeah. I've got like a 1% grade out like at the end of my driveway, and occasionally I've ridden a bike with the kids. Get to the end of the driveway, and I'm like, fuck this. This <laughs> <laughs> is like and I do, one of the new e bikes. <laughs> <laughs> and I do have another bottle for you, because you guys did rum with the guys from Classic Car Studio. Yep. Yeah. So this is from my wife. It's a bottle of Foursquare. They call this the Pappy of Rum. Really? Are you serious? Yeah. So that's um, that's legit rum. So Thank you, Jason. that way you got yeah, that's from JC. Appreciate um, so it. So she said you should take her a bottle of that. Take them a bottle of that. So yeah, that's four square. They they do um, I think that one's in bourbon barrels, uh, aged in bourbon and sherry cask. Um, but that's JC's favorite rum. From, so. from Barbados. Yeah, the yeah. the rum I kind of got learned on that and you know, I always shy away from it because you just think like you think of rum, you think of like Bacardi and Coke oh, yeah. with yep. a lime. Yep. But man, there's some phenomenal rums. You yep. never think to drink them neat like that. Yep. Well, that's the that thing is that's a sipper. You know, it's not, you don't mix that with Coke. Because we made that mistake is I had Foursquare and my buddy drinks rum and Cokes. And he couldn't tell the difference between that and when I bought eight-year-old Florida Kanye and a gallon jug for him. Yeah. It, they taste exactly the same to him. That's not, oh. he doesn't get that then. And in fact, I need, to, I need to go rescue my wife because I was in Nashville three days ago doing some work and um, my buddy was down there and he goes, oh, your wife gave me this bourbon and sweet tea and it's the best thing I ever had. I was like, my wife is mixing good bourbon with sweet tea. Mm. She definitely needs to be rescued from Florida. <laughs> yeah, so. 
Hopefully she's doing it with cheap bourbon. Hopefully uh, that ZZ Top bourbon's getting mixed with yeah. I think you'd still taste that oh, no, over any mixer. Oh, you're going to give it with the big yeah, wax. Ahead. Yeah, I, I bought it. Open. I bought it exactly for the barrel. I mean, for the <clears> bottle. <throat> but I was like, it can't be as bad as these guys say it is. And then we got it. And me and her both were like, like it didn't even smell good. Yeah, you it know? was. And it's like, and I love Balconis. They're there in Waco. And I've had the tour and they've got a bar inside. They'll make cocktails for you. And I mean, it's their single barrel is great. And I just don't know what they did on that. And it's everybody's got to miss sometimes. Oh, Never. so the other thing on this barrel here is when you guys had that barrel from Australia the other day. Yeah. And you were like, I wonder how far it went from Kentucky to Australia, Australia to back. Well, it's 9,000 miles one way as the crow flies. That bottle's <laughs> been 14,000 miles in the Sprinter van since Zig I bought it. All the way. Oh, so, really? Yeah. So, but I got beat by 4,000 miles. But <laughs> <laughs> Does it age more in the Sprinter? I don't know. But, you know, you brought up that thing with uh, Jefferson's. Like maybe I should get them to put a barrel in the Sprinter, and I oh, could yeah. just it yeah. could be the not stock edition, <clears throat> and the bourbon just rolls. You know, when I go down the road and age it. We were talking about doing that. Take uh, everything here, all the leftovers, make an infinity yeah, barrel, paint so, house glass. Right oh yeah, there. I've got two of these in the Sprinter. These are great. Down the throw it in the semi well, and drive around the car show season for a year, and yep. additionally age it. That or you could one. just do like most of the liquor companies out there and just, just say it. you did that. <laughs> yeah. And then put a cool logo. <laughs> well, that the was the thing with Jefferson's is that first batch was legit aged in a boat. Yeah. And then the rest of it, there a lot of the, the next run was blended whiskey that wasn't really aged in a boat. It just, but if you look, it says Jefferson's on it. It doesn't say yeah. all the stuff that first batch had on. It's still good. I mean, it's still good because everybody's buying stuff from Buffalo Trace and whoever and blending it. So it's still good stuff. That Pritchard cask one is good. That Jefferson's Pritchard cask is a good one. Yeah, they have they have really good stuff. I'm not trying to, you know, say they don't. It's just, but when they they built their whole market on that first thing, yeah, and then they're still doing that. They're still aging stuff in ships. But what happens is, you know, it's six years old. Well, you run out of six years old. Well, it's another six years before you have six year old yeah. again. You know, so, and that's what happened with. Um, I don't know if you know what's what happened with the Japanese whiskey market is. Um, there was so much of it, but then it wound up, they ran out of whiskey because it wasn't aged because the, the market was so young that they didn't have enough whiskey just to keep doing it every year. So it got super rare and super expensive, but now the market's getting flooded with Japanese whiskey again. Hmm. So it comes in, really comes in waves. It's, it does. It's hot. Yeah. Oh, it is they're definitely hot. So yeah. I that's, mean, that's a sipper for sure. Yeah. But, but it's, man, it's got it's a very good. like a uh, caramelly oh. flavor. It oh. dances. Pro props yeah. to Texas. <laughs> way to, way to redeem yourself, Texas. Yeah. Well, I'm glad. Like I said, as, at least as, as long as I get a seven, I'm, oh, I'm yeah, fine that's, with it. That's so. up there, man. That's yeah. good stuff. But again, it's hot, and my wife likes hot whiskey, so that she recommended this barrel as well. Yeah, what so. they say, some like it hot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You've been waiting oh, some man. to get that in. Teed it up. <laughs> some people do say that. Uh, so we got, a, we got a lot to get into, so why don't we start from the beginning. Tell us, uh, tell us how you got your start in all of this. So... You mentioned that I work for a NASCAR team, and I always said if I ever write an autobiography, the first half of my life would be I was the worst employee ever. That would be the name of my because I was, I was pretty much a crap worker and a crap human being the early parts of my life. And I know normally you don't get those guys to say that on here, but it was like I just didn't know what I was supposed to do in my life. So I was born in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, and uh, lived in a tiny little town across the river called Ware, Illinois, when I was a kid. And um, it was one of those ones that um, – so now they call them tiny homes, but when I was a kid, they called them trailers. I live in a trailer. <laughs> and so, but my mom never let me know we were broke. Like I always had matchbox cars, always had baseball gloves, always had that stuff. And he never, and you look back at it as a kid, being an adult now that your mom really worked really hard, worked two jobs just so you could have a 99 cent matchbox car, you know? That's cool. And, but when you're, but when you're a kid, you're like, why don't I have two matchbox cars? You yep. know? And it's like, I was a pretty dick kid, you know? <laughs> and, most, um, most kids are. Yeah. So. <laughs> So we'll go into a while. So when I tell my wife this story, when we met, when I met her the first time, she was like, you could just lie to me and tell me, you, you don't have to give me this whole story. It's like, just <laughs> tell me the truth. <laughs> yeah. So when I was 13, my mom got a job. Um, well, let me go earlier in this. So we'll go into my car history as well. So growing up in Cape Girardeau, my grandfather was an over the road truck driver. And so my whole life was watching and he was, and I didn't have a, I didn't have a dad growing up. So my grandfather was my dad. And so every time he would leave to go cross country, basically my dad left, you know? And so my grandmother and my mom, they took care of me and then made me go to church every Sunday. And I went to private school, went to church school, all this other stuff. And then every summer when I was off of school, I would go on the road with my grandfather. So from when I was six, seven years old, I was going to steel mills in New York city with my grandfather. And I was learning to tarp loads and all this other stuff. And as a kid, that's amazing. 
But, you know, I look back on that now and how hard my grandfather worked. And then also how much he didn't have any patience for a kid, <laughs> especially. Sure. So um, I have a couple of funny stories on that. I remember once we we're driving through New York City and we get behind the semi and on the back of this reefer trailer, it says kitty liquor. And I'm like, oh, why would this guy want to lick kitties? <laughs> and then my grandfather's like, hey, have you heard that new Merle Haggard song? And he's putting cassettes in the cassette player. And then one day when I'm, when I'm like 16, I'm like, oh, kitty liquor. <laughs> you know, so so I, I felt bad for him for that. And then I remember one of my first trips to Texas, um, we used to have those Landshire burritos at school. So that's as a kid, that's the only burrito I'd ever have, like in a plastic thing, like at the gas station. Sure. So we stop at... And I loved pickles as a kid. And um, so we stopped this truck stop. It's a real Mexican diner in it and everything like that. So I get this California burrito covered in queso, and it has jalapenos over the top of it. And as a kid being a dummy from the Midwest, Illinois, I was like, why would they put pickles on this? And my grandfather's <laughs> like, I don't know. You should probably just eat them. And so I'm just like, romp, romp. and all of a sudden I was like, oh, my mouth's on fire. And it's like, so that was my first taste of jalapenos. Those were Mexican <laughs> pickles. Because they were Mexican pickles. So, yeah. I was going to ask you, yeah. Mexican pickles. Mexican yeah. pickles. <laughs> the, uh, the, I, I as well went to private school, went to church. My dad was a preacher and stuff. So like you're saying, you're, you're, you're in that. And then for three months out of the year, you're listening to what they say on the CB the whole time oh, yeah. and stuff yeah. like that. That's a, you're that's, learning both. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's yeah. the devils right there. Yeah. Oh yeah. Cause it was definitely, it was, you know, every day and this, well, I'll get more into this, uh, the side of it here when I move out of, of, uh, Illinois. But, um, so, but it was just funny. It's like, but that's, I got to see my grandfather basically work his ass off and then lose all of his money and the teamsters strike. And, uh, so he lost all of his pension, all that stuff. And that dude, when he was 70, was working for a salvage company out of Illinois, pulling log skidders out of the swamp of Louisiana when he's 70 years old by himself. Damn. And it's like, it was just a shame that, you know, like a lot of those guys got done wrong like that, you know, that worked their asses off their whole life. And, you know, it's like, but that's what made the country. And it's just a shame that, that you know, just because of some guys got greedy, you know, that kind of got screwed. But I don't want to make a super downer out of it. But like, you know, I grew up in that long haul trucking family of owner operators, which really don't exist anymore. And um, I still have a love for big rigs and traveling the country, and it's all because of that. So, did but, they wear Adidas pants and sandals <laughs> with socks back then? No, or they did not. They were they were fucking men back then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. has Wrangler jeans and cowboy <laughs> boots, probably right. <laughs> that's the uh, Kent Waters originals jeans. Yeah, because <laughs> that's what it sounds like—a pair of custom pants. Yeah. yeah. So, but no. So, so when I was a kid, my first seeing anything custom was uh, Bigfoot. Well, they came to the Southeast Missouri State Fair in Cape Girardeau, and it was, I must have been six or seven, because that's how long ago that was. And all Bigfoot did was rode around a circle, everybody cheered, and then it drove up on cars and parked. <laughs> that's, that's all Bigfoot did back then. And then you're like, oh, that's this awesome. is the coolest oh, yeah. thing I've ever yeah. seen. The sound was just oh. like, that's life changing. Yeah. yeah, but no telling how many kids' lives Bob Chandler changed. That's who you should get on the podcast, Bob Chandler. Oh, you want to talk about a dude that's got some stories. I'll bet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause he's got to be he's got to be pushing mid eighties now. So yeah, that would be good. Yeah, put that on the list. Yeah, yeah. Him and Dennis Anderson. Yeah. Oh yeah, that'd be a great one too. Mm. Oh, so when I'm 13, so I've my mom worked two jobs. She worked at a grocery store, worked at the church as an accountant. My mom's always been good at math. Every female in my family's been good at math, and um, I've been good at just driving around in a car. <laughs> so that's, but um. I just wasn't motivated. So when I was 13, my mom got a job. I guess I need to stop hitting the top of this table. You're fine. <laughs> so I, when I was 13, my mom got a job in upstate New York working for a home for troubled young people, which was religious based. So kids had the opportunity to either go to jail or go to juvie or come to this home. And um, so it was, I went from being basically just middle of a cornfield school to upstate New York, going to school with a bunch of kids from New York City. And I was a minority in my school, which probably actually did me really well in life in general, because you really, any prejudice you have, when you become a minority in school, you quickly get over it. <laughs> and uh, if not, they help you get over it. <laughs> but, uh, but, no, but, you know, it's, but that was also that religious based school. And um, when you would get in trouble, you'd have to write the book of Proverbs. So I know a lot about the book of Proverbs. And then being in New York, everything was wood fire to heat all the buildings. 
So if you got in trouble, you had to move the wood pile from one side of the parking lot to the other side of the parking lot and then back to the other side of the parking lot. Like you are old. They're still yeah. doing wood fires. Jeez, oh, they I still was, do wood fires. I in was New trying York. to see, like, I'm thinking, is this Josh telling this story? Or is well, when Josh and I first <laughs> met, we were shoveling coal and stuff as a young lad. And, yeah. yeah, when Josh and I first met, it was during the wagon trains and we, like, we waved at each <laughs> other when we passed on the way. <laughs> Homestead. Uh, on the yeah. Great Plains. Yeah, right? yeah. 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 <laughs> Did brother John, John? Yeah. <laughs> brother Josh. Yeah, brother <laughs> so, so I go to this school and it's one of those ones where they give you little books to work in and you work at your own pace and all this other stuff. So we're in Nashville. I did the exact same thing. So it was the ACE curriculum. So, yeah. I don't know if you, so we're in Nashville. You're supposed to have, you're supposed to have, uh, they give those to kids that like have a conscience and are going to be honest about things. Oh, well, that wasn't for me. Though. Yeah, it wasn't for me either. Because if they said you work at your own pace and when you're done with these, you're done. Oh, yeah. Well, that meant I can just finish them all. I knew I knew the way to cheat on all those things. Yes. <laughs> so so since you know the <laughs> curriculum, these guys didn't. So there was little cartoon characters, all this other stuff in there. And, um, and of course, they prepare you for real life. So instead of t- giving you like Spanish or, you know, homemaking or anything, you take New Testament survey and Old Testament survey because nothing... Prov- prepares you for the real world yeah. than the old Testament, you know? So <laughs> at that but, time though, I mean, yeah, back in the, it was yeah. probably like a current event. Yeah, we were, right? It was just the Testament. We, yeah, it wasn't yeah, old. Yeah. yeah. It was just the Testament. It's like people talk about OBS trucks. No, they were just trucks. <laughs> yeah. Alan Johnson did that one day. I was like, he's like, I wish you guys would stop calling these OBSs. Cause when I first got one of those, they were just a new truck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we were in Nashville for good guys and, um, we get an Uber. And our Uber is an Amish guy. And I was like, I didn't know this was a thing. But he gets a black new Impala, no stereo, no nothing, base model. And that's his mission is to be an Uber driver in Nashville and tell people, I don't don't know if you're going to convince people to be Amish or what. I think it's just to preach to people and let them know there's a better way. And uh, so come to find out that guy did the same school system that we did. So my wife is just dying. She's like, so tell me about it again. So, so you guys don't have electricity, right? And I was like, oh, I'll never get the end of this. But yeah. So, so the one bright side of this school is they did a program. I, it was, we're basically outside of Watkins Glen. So as a kid, we'd get to go to Watkins Glen for free and we get to, we get, actually get to volunteer and help race teams. And then they wound up working a deal with NASCAR that, um, you know, the kids from the program could be on the pit roads on the weekend. And then my mom and another lady kind of helped head start that program. Well, with me just tagging along, I got to start helping out. So when I was probably, probably a junior in high school, I started helping out on the seven car and working for free. I was gluing lug nuts, running tires, running gas, all this other stuff. And then I went to college and then college just wasn't for me. I'm not good at studying anyway. It's like, you know, but it's always been cars. So it's, you know, and I made good friends with one of the mechanics at the shop. And he's like, well, just because I was like, I was ta- I still talk to him all the time. I was like, I just don't know what I want to do. He goes, well, just come to Charlotte. You can sleep on our couch and you can work at the shop during the day and go to the races with on the weekend until you figure out what you want to do. So I went down there and worked at Radio Shack at night, worked the shop for free every day, and then went to the races every weekend, you know, and just, you know, and I wound up becoming second gas man, which at the time you know, two different gas guys across the wall. And then he started cutting down a number of guys. So I was the second gas man. So I got to go over the wall and put gas in the car. And, uh, but like I said, I was a horrible employee. It's like, I got every opportunity on the planet, but like all I wanted to do was build mini trucks and <laughs> build loud stereos. And then since I went to private school my whole life, like our school, because of the students that were in it, guys and girls couldn't talk, you know, because obviously, you know, that's why they got in trouble in the first place. And so I'm not allowed to talk to girls and stuff either. So as soon as I get to North Carolina, I mean, I'm like, there's liquor, there's women. And it's like, so all I want to do is party and hang out with do my buddies. Do all the things you said not to thing, do. All the things I've said not to do. Yeah. And uh, so. Uh, Were Clark, you a worse employee for Radio Shack or the number seven car? I was actually a good employee <laughs> for Radio Shack because you look at the level. Like, so everybody that worked the seven car was next level. Like those guys were legit. And so <laughs> I was here. But when it came to Radio Shack... I just kind of knew my shit <laughs> and then like everybody else was here. So, so you, like, they, you didn't aspire at all to like bring yourself up. 
in that pit crew you just no, said. No, I did not. I and now Radio Shack, you're like, and no, that was King and, shit, the, Radio Shack, and, and in those guys' around. defense, they tried everything to help me be a better person <laughs> and to work my ass off. And I did everything I could not to. And it's like, I mean, I showed up and worked, but you know how it is. You get guys here at your shop. There's the guys who show up and work and there's the guys who work. Yep. And it's like, I was just the guy who showed up and worked. And it was like one of those ones. It's like, well, it's five o'clock. I'm going home. And everybody else stays till seven because, you know, Alan owned his own team and he expected more out of everybody. So my whole first year, you know, I kind of just fumbled through it, you know, and then after Alan passed away in 93, I got hired full time. And uh, because Paul comes in and goes, hey, we're going to give you a shot, let you work here full time. And uh, but it's big difference when someone's paying you to screw around. And then it is when someone's letting you screw around for free. And uh, so I just totally blew that. But the thing is, like a lot of that stuff I learned from those guys then I use now, you know, like my, my work ethic now is amazing. But my work ethic up until I was 25 or 26 was just shit. You know, but that, but you know, that just proves that everybody, you know, like you don't, just because you haven't made it by the time you're 25, 26 years old, doesn't mean that you can't make it. Right. You know? <clears throat> and, uh, I know this is probably the worst story because everybody else is like, Oh, I built a 32 Ford that won this when I was 20 years old. And I'm all like, yeah, I sucked. You know? <laughs> so you got to see all good. sides. Yeah. Of it. That's, yeah. that's good to know. We actually had a kid here mm-hmm. who we turned into a photographer. No disrespect. I know, it's photography. Remember the, the young boy cleanup kid that oh, uh, yeah. we had this kid, man. And he just like was kind of like you described, just did not want to he work had that ethic, type of work ethic, yep. non-existent. Right. Yeah. And uh, starts cleaning up, dragging ass, can't push a broom, can't do anything. And then decides that like, this is what I want to do for a living. I want to be a car builder and I'm going to pursue this. So he comes to me and asks me how he should go about, learning the craft, learning more about hot rods, more about cars. I said, well, dude, you've been in this shop for like about a year now (laughs) and you haven't learned shit because like you refuse to do virtually anything. So he learned how to hide pretty good. So if I could be, if I could be totally, and then he said, cause I'm, 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 he's weighing out the options between I could be a car builder or I'm going to be a photographer. I said, dude, like if you want to be a car builder, you got to start like busting your ass all the tools are here. There's tons of guys that will teach you. Come in, put the work in. So, but if you want me to just like some fatherly advice here, if I could be totally fucking honest with you, I don't think you've got it, dude. <laughs> like <laughs> maybe photography is a better career path yeah. for you. And I think the brutal, <laughs> brutal honesty maybe was, uh, he left yeah, well, he, and well, pursued he, a different career. He kicked but, it into gear for a couple of weeks. Um, but then <clears throat> at that point it was. But sometimes um, what you really want to do isn't what you should do. You know, Most, and, and I'm like, I'm, I'm really a good example of that, you know, because like the whole, let's see, I've been taking pictures of cars for over 20 years and that whole up until I found that, like right now I'm doing what I was born to do, but I didn't find that till I was like in my thirties, you know, cause I was, I've been a service manager at car dealerships and I was really good at that because obviously I talk too much, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but also that job helped me get to where nothing bothers me. Cause nothing gets you prepared for that than some soccer mom yelling oh, yeah. at her that she has to pay a bill, you know, on her car that's under warranty. And it's like, I've been cussed by the best of them. It's like, you're not going to bother me. So nothing really shakes me anymore. It's like, and I'm, and I'm really good at what I do. So it doesn't really, it doesn't matter the situation. I'll make it work, you know? And it's like, but I wanted to be that way as a NASCAR mechanic in the nineties, but it just wasn't meant to be because I, I had a lot of growing up to get, that I didn't get while I was in school because, you know, you had to do this and go through all this. So funny story of my school. Do you remember when um, Tipper Gore did the deal about putting parental advisories on the um, on rap records and stuff like yes. that? So if you Google the videos of the protests of that, you'll see kids in white shirts, blue pants, and the ACE ties that we used to have to wear. And that's my school. Really? So, yeah. So, huh. awesome. so the whole... So the preacher who ran everything had a TV show and all that stuff. So I actually started, that was my first job sweeping floors. I started sweeping floors at the television studio there, which was actually a world-class television studio at the time because they had guys that worked for Kodak come down and help build it. And it was all done with donations and everything like that. So from day one, I got to work with guys who are really good at lighting stuff. So that's my lighting style actually comes from me lighting TV stuff, like making shadows on the wall and all this other stuff on psych walls and everything. So all that stuff I learned then, I didn't know I'd need it later. But when I came to start lighting cars, it was like, oh, well, it's just, it's just this, you know? So it was all that stuff that I thought 
when I went to become a NASCAR mechanic, I would never use any of that. But then, you know, so did you get shit canned at the NASCAR place? Yeah. So (laughs) (laughs) you were talking about hiding. My best one was like, so every Monday after a race, they would pull the motors Mm -hmm. and everything out of the cars because, you know, we didn't, you didn't have 300 cars then, you know, you've got like seven, you know? So they would pull that motor out and then start dissembling stuff. So my job was to get all the rubber off the bottom of the cars, you know, like really shit job. And I would just fall asleep with my arms across the <laughs> trans tunnel and all this other stuff. And, you know, and I never in my mind got caught doing that, but I'm sure they all knew what I was doing. So, but, but, but yeah, so every moment I get to find those guys, I apologize to them because, you know, our, our original gas man was Dale Jr.'s crew chief. And so my friend Mickey Russell, who is a fabricator for Stuart, uh, I was like, hey, when you tell him, tell him that I said I'm sorry. And then see if he even remembers me. And he goes, oh, he remembers you. And he goes, he don't remember you being that bad. I was like, oh, I was really bad. <laughs> but Tony was a, such a nice guy. He was another one of those guys that just out of his way. Funny story we're talking about fabricators is when Paul came, when they hired me full time, he's like, well, where do you want to work in the shop? And I was like, oh, I want to be a fabricator. So we have these two old school, like New York, been in the Navy fabricators. And, um, they're like, um, they're like, okay, these guys are gonna show you how to be a fabricator. Well, those guys wanted nothing to do with teaching me how to fabricate. Cause I'm just a dumb kid. And, and it's not like today where, you know, it's like no one, there really was a mentorship program in that. And so I'm there and all I do for probably five months is haul metal for those guys and cut, you know, stuff out with, you know, a saw. And then finally Paul's like, I think we're gonna put you in a body shop. And he goes, uh, he goes, it's kind of like fabrication, but you know, it's <laughs> just you deal with different materials. <laughs> and at the time there's a lot of bondo on race cars. Yeah. And, uh, so <clears throat> as soon as I go from the fab shop to the body shop, I go from get the fuck out of the way to just put some bondo on it. We can just, we'll, we'll get it off. It's, it's like an just inch do thick whatever. at the back. That's fine. We got, we'll, we'll be outside the smoke. jig. Just put bondo here. We're gonna go outside and smoke. We'll be back in about 20 minutes. And it's, so it, it wound up being one of those ones. And that what was funny is you talk about fitting that is, uh, I remember in the wind tunnel, we started shaping the driver's side windows. So they were really small. Now, of course, now there's a template for the windows. And, um, but at the time it was like, you start shaping the window. And cause when I went to Stewart's the last time we used to have like five or six templates in the nineties. And now you, this thing comes down from the ceiling and it's got like 20 some template pieces oh, on it. Wild. And then the new car is all laser. Have you seen that? Yeah. Like yeah. they run it through and it's all laser yeah. scan. And it's like, how do you, how are you allowed to cheat now? Was that yeah. weird? Was it Roush? Where were we? Was it Roush? Yeah. yeah. God, was that, that was unbelievable. Yeah, it's, it was like spaceship level. Shit. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's sad. I mean, it's cool, but it's sad. Like technology is cool, but it's like, yeah, especially when you think that it wasn't that long ago. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't. 20 to yeah. 25 years well, ago. Even from me in 93, to say 2020 or 2018 at Stewart's to now. Yeah. It's like it went even from that 2020 to 2023 is just such a huge jump to that car tomorrow. And it's like, cause I know when they hired Gary Nelson the first time is like, it was always, if you want to catch a cheater, hire the best cheater. So that's why they hired Gary Nelson, you know? So it's, but, but yeah, I wouldn't change in that time of my life other than the fact that I'd like, the only reason I want to do over is so that I could be a better employee. But if I was a better employee, I might still be doing it. I wouldn't be doing what I was born to do. So you have to look at it like that too. Is like I every day, if I see one of those guys, I want to apologize to them for not being a harder worker and not carrying my weight. And um, but it was fun times, like a settling bomb stuff like that was always fun. But it was and it was just a good group of guys, and it was a small group of guys, all just you know, it's kind of like having a shop here, and you guys, you know, you have a vision of where you need to go. And those guys all knew where they need to go, and they worked hard to do there. And I just didn't carry my weight. So, what was the wake up call for you? Where you're like man, I got to start like getting my shit in line here and I got to start working harder. Well, getting fired from an NASCAR team kind of puts you wake up call. Yeah. yeah. Well, what well, I still didn't quite get it. And then the, the big thing that got me was I went, I went home kind of dejected. And of course, at first you want to blame everybody yourself, you know, and it's like, Oh it was, yeah, yeah, whatever, you know? And, um, Cause by then Jeff Bodine owned the team and the year before that we won 10 races on Hoosiers. Then of course the next year we're on good years again. All of a sudden our tires suck. I don't know why. I don't know how that would happen, but, <laughs> but so I go back home for a while and then I just kind of, I lucked into a job through a temp agency being a service advisor for a Chevy dealer. And I wound up going back to Illinois where my grandparents were cause my grandfather was sick. And um, so I go back there and I start working for the dealership. Then I start building the, 10 and a half tire Mustang that was really fast. And, um, 
you know, and um, I was racing all the old guys with Corvettes. I worked for a Chevy dealer, and all those guys would get a new Corvette and go, that's the fastest thing in the parking lot. And I'm like, eh, this 11-second Mustang says otherwise, you know. And it's Bottle more, car or what? Yeah, yeah, bottle car, yeah. And um, so it was all that. And then I was still running. I was running around with very loose women and and all that, and, you know, the stuff like we like to do. And I'm still under 30. And uh, one day my grandfather just comes in, sits next to me on the couch, and basically says, hey, you're fucking up. <laughs> And like that dude never said anything to me like that in my life. And it was like, that was my wake up call. And then that next day I went into work and I, I worked harder as a service advisor to dealers than I ever worked. And even, even my boss was like, who is this? <laughs> you know, it's like, and it was just, and I stopped messing around as much as I had. And then I wound up moving to, uh, let's see, where did I go next? I wound up moving to Florida where I met my wife. And then, then the story gets really good. You what, know, well, what brings so. you to, like, how do you just jump from Illinois to Florida? Well, so I, I have I, that. I live, I'm born and raised. I've <clears> moved in like a five mile radius here, but just to jump like one end of the country, other end of the country. I have this thing where I get bored staying in one place. And my, luckily my wife understands it. And I think my grandfather had it and he was born in the hills of Missouri. So like, even when he was 13 or 14 years old, there's a picture of him in like some old B model Mac pulling logs out of a hill, like black and white photos of him pulling logs, cool. you know, like a, a real man. I mean, that's like <laughs> not even close to what we are now. You know, it's like right. we're a totally different species compared to those dudes. And uh, so, you know, I just had this thing where I'm like, I just get bored sitting in one spot. And that was the hard part with just working at a day job every day, working at the dealership. It's like, I was good at it, but it's like, I just didn't belong sitting. I get fidgety. You know, and I, I go home now and I, I'd sit on the couch with my father-in-law who just recently passed away. And, um, nice. but, um, I'd sit on the couch with him and he'd be watching football and I'd be like, I need to go do something. <laughs> it's like, and I've just always had that. So like, to me, it was nothing like I never really had a home, you know, until I met my wife, I never had a home, you know, it was like, and then my home's parked in your parking lot now. Cause <laughs> that's probably a first for this show. The guy who shows up and sleeps in your parking lot. So no, nah, well, we've had people sleeping well that's a, <laughs> maybe first of the show yeah, but that's yeah. a different level first. of bearded person yeah. <laughs> what uh did you have something lined up in florida did you have a job no so yeah was it just jump and figure it out so my wife down? loves these stories i went to florida chasing a woman so when i met this woman she had a model a coupe had this house in jacksonville and uh she was single and all this so and i had friends in florida so it wasn't like i just chased her so like I'd been going to truck shows with my buddy and I was, I was photographing cars at the time and, uh, had been doing it on the side and everything like that. And, uh, so he's like, his dad was part owner of a dealership in Florida. And I was like, Hey, my dad said you could have a job if you want to come down here and hang out with us. You can even stay with us. And then I met that girl online. I was like, this girl's got a model a and she goes to all the hot rod shows. I'm going to go hang out with her. So then I move in with her and come to find out her roommates, her ex-boyfriend, which is never good. And then that car that she was sending me pictures of was hers belonged to the guy who owned the house that she did not own. And then the, and then the tanning salon business that she owned was her brother and sister's business. And then she just worked there. So it was old school oh, catfishing. Yeah. Yeah. There goes, there goes yeah. your sugar mama right yeah, on the back. Like, there goes my sugar mama. So, um, yeah. So, so yeah, I've had a lot of bad luck in women, but, uh, but that's what got me to Florida. And then my, the guy that was my best friend at the time introduced me to my wife. He actually used to date her back in the day. And um, so he hooked me up with her basically as a booty call. And then we've been inseparable ever since. So, so you just never know where you're going to find love. You know? Yep. Head to Florida. <laughs> yeah. You were already photographer, you know, taking pictures of stuff then, yep. car-wise? Yeah. So so how I started in that is uh, I actually started, and I saw you guys had a copy of it upstairs in Chris's office, but Performance Auto and Sound Magazine, the Canadian magazine. Um, so I'd been going to truck shows my whole life and obviously many trucks and, uh, past mag used to have a section called rear view and it was trucks. And, um, I met the editor at probably many Nats back way back in the day. And I think we were probably still shooting. We might've still been shooting film then. And, um, so I, he'd seen some of my work, you know, just pictures. Cause I just took pictures at every show I went. Cause I love cars. I was like, Oh, this is cool. Let me take pictures. So he saw some of my pictures that editor from <clears throat> performance auto and sound saw some of my work and was like, you should, you should do this. You're really good at it. And I was like, I think it'd just take the fun out of it. I just like going to car shows and looking at cars. I just take pictures of stuff I like. And he goes, we'll do that. But just next time, send me pictures. And, um, and I was like, all right, whatever. So I kind of blew him off. And then there was an event he had to come to. And I think it was another pigeon forge event. And he goes, Hey, 
uh, my plane got iced over. I can't make it. Can you shoot the show for me for show coverage? So I shot show coverage and then like mini truck and Nats. Yeah, it was probably mini truck Nats. I, and I think it was already after the show split when it was a his and a hers. And, um, I sent him the pictures. The next thing I know, I got a check and I was like, wait, he didn't tell me to pay me for this. And I was like, I'm so then it got into that whole thing where like, you could find out like a show promoter will give you a hotel room. They'll pay you some gas money and all the other stuff. And then magazines actually used to pay really well. And, uh, so I just started shooting for car magazines, you know, and it was like, and then we went to Houston for my wife to pursue her doctorate in mathematics at MD Anderson. And, um, the, I was working at a dealership. So I was, so after we got married, I got, a, I lined up a job at a dealership there. And I'd always been lucky where I worked for dealerships that were owned by, owned by individuals. Cause anytime a conglomerate buys it, it all just goes to crap. And, uh, so I worked in Houston for about probably close to a year at a Hyundai dealer and, um, they got bought out by a local, a big conglomerate. And, um, so I told her the one, and I'd started getting more and more work of shooting features, not just that. And the features paid really well. At the time I was working for mini truck and rod and custom, a bunch of other magazines like that. So I said, Hey, I'm going to quit my day job and become a photographer full time. So you go from making a hundred grand a year on my last year as a service manager to making 35 or 40,000. And she's also a student at university at the time. And then I always tell the story that she just rolled over and said, okay, and then, but I think in her mind, I don't think she's probably slept since then. <laughs> okay. That's probably the, like, the last time she ever had good sleep because one of us worries about everything and the other one doesn't worry about nothing. I'm the one that's like, oh, the plastic thing still puts fuel in the Sprinter van, <laughs> you know? So it's like, my, she, and she told me too, not to talk about it this whole one. She basically gave me the Will Smith speech, keep your wife's name out of, my, out of your mouth. <laughs> so, but I would not be where I am today if it wasn't for her. And she is way smarter than I am and obviously way better looking than I am, but well, not stock photography wouldn't be here for one for my wife. And um, so I want to give her props for it, even though she said she didn't want to be mentioned in this podcast other than her delivering rum for you guys. So yeah, it always, it's always the woman behind for sure to allow most of us to do the dumb things that we do on a daily basis. Well, also to the fact that we all, I always joke that I've been married in dog years so even though we'll be married almost 15 years, we've only been together for two. So it's like a year seven, you know, because, but that's probably what keeps me married because I am, all I want to do is look at cars all the time. So I think I stay married because when I do go home, that's her time and we go to concerts and we do this. And then also if I'm someplace cool, she flies out. Cause when you buy as much diesel fuel as I do in a year, you get free points to fly Southwest. So she gets to, she's like, where are you at? And I'm like, Des Moines. She goes, well, let me know where you're at next week. And then when I'm in Scottsdale, she's like, oh, I'm coming to I'll Arizona. And yeah, my wife does the same thing. Yeah. Never come to Columbus, Des yeah. Moines, oh, yeah. Kansas My City, wife but... went to Columbus Good Guys once, and I think she's over Columbus. She's like, isn't there any better food than this here? And then it's like. <laughs> when's Scottsdale? Yeah, when's Scottsdale? Pleasanton, San Diego? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Oh, yeah, San Diego. She's all in for that. But but in Des Moines' defense, <clears throat> uh, we have really good friends in Oskaloosa, the Kelderman Air Suspension guys, because the Sprinter has their air suspension on it. And, um, but we found really good steak restaurants in Des Moines now. And there's so many good breweries in Des Moines now. Like Des Moines is not the town it used to be. So if you want to go to a good guy's show, but also have a trip where you get good food and good beer, Des Moines is actually one you should put on your radar. Hmm. It's actually pretty decent. Forget about your little foodie run. You should open like a secondary business of like a traveling food critic. Well, my, my YouTube channel would probably do better if I did food and whiskey and didn't do um, just cars. Just do just cars. They're like, yeah. I've seen cars, but let's talk about that steak. Oh, also, by the way, my wife wants to sincerely <clears throat> thank you guys for North of Bourbon. Uh, yeah. So you are welcome. That is. Yeah, so that when we went to Louisville this year, we had five meals there. <laughs> <laughs> it is quite the treat. It yeah. is quite the treat. Yeah. And those guys, I mean, they should bottle that up. I mean, that's. Yeah. Yeah, they got I a mean, good thing going on. And over everybody there. there's nice because those, even the shaved ice drinks. Oh. There's oh, stuff the Mr. that you Peanut. would never have ordered before. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But when you're like, I trust you, man. Just bring them. Well, I've started making the old fashions with a Luxardo. Okay. You know, because they do that one with the Luxardo instead of using the the simple syrup, the simple syrup and stuff in it and the, the cherry syrup. It is so good even just to shake it as a regular cocktail. I mean, it's so good. But those guys, it's like, I, I that's one of those ones that I'm like, I know you guys hate 
to mention it because the next time you go to Louisville, you're like, oh, I can't get in. Yeah, I know. Because <laughs> that place is small. <laughs> we have VIP status. Yeah, I, I can imagine. You get you get your own little barrel that you get to sit in because that's cool oh, too. Because yeah. you didn't, I didn't realize hungry. it. I yeah, better right be, now. I feel I'll like be curious to see where those guys go. Like if yeah. they if they expand, if they blow it. They're a little bit like on the outskirts. Yeah. 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 Well, I also wonder Germantown? about them too because like even all the good restaurants in Austin, excuse me, you get where um, like places Houston and Austin are the same way. Places will stay open for two or three years, and then that guy will go open something else. You know, because it's like, because that is their art, you know, so they're like, oh, we've got this now. So like, say North of Bourbon might be a Cajun place that does drinks now. Well, then it might be a barbecue place. Like they might, they might be an right. Asian place, you know? So I almost, I tried to, I tried to ship you guys a brisket. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Cause uh, Truth Barbecue in Houston, next time you guys are Houston, you got to go to Truth. And it's like, those guys are legit. And, um, and there's also Blood Brothers, which is basically a Korean bar. They got a Michelin star this year, I believe. Wow. And yeah. it's Korean barbecue, Texas style. And so there's like <clears throat> brisket ramen. I don't know, make you guys all hungry now. Wow, that sounds good. Phil lays it down yeah. with, the, with the meats. Yeah. I, I think I'm yet to, I mean, my wife, she close second. Sometimes she can overtake you, but I've yet to be at like a restaurant or a barbecue place that competes, yeah. which is kind of ruined. Well, my wife says that with my steaks. It's like ruined yeah. restaurants. You I know? buy legit steaks because like <clears> right down the street from us in a town of land, I was a place called Miller Meat Market. Like you walk in, there's steak there. But if you don't see what you want, they'll cut it in the back. So, like, on my 50th birthday, I walk in, I go, you guys don't have any uh, uh, fillets? And they're like, well, how big do you want? And I was like, well, how big can I get? And they're like, 18 <laughs> ounces. And I'm like, uh, That's a little big in a fillet. I'm like, let's do 12. <laughs> but 12 is still a massive yeah, fillet. Yeah, so, yeah. like, I bacon wrapped it. So, you have to double layer the bacon. The steak's hanging over there. <laughs> <laughs> Squeeze it out. But, yeah, so, but, like. That's another reason why I live where I live is because I feel like they just walk out back and go, Hey, Bessie, I need another cut of meat off of you. <laughs> you know, it's like, but like that, that like Miller's that, place is amazing. Uh, that place in Wyoming we went to, it was a truck stop with a steak restaurant next door and yeah. the whole cattle field behind it. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. You and see a lot of that in Texas too. Yeah. Well, that's like when I, um, I'd always wanted to go to Circus Circus's steak restaurant. <clears throat> and everybody yes. always tells me that's the best one. It one. is. Oh, it's it's legit. Really? Is it really? Yeah, it's yeah. not there anymore. And it's, but no, it's still there. We had it Circus for SEMA Circus this year. Is done. Oh, is it gone? Yeah, I thought oh. Circus Circus is done. Oh, we went there this past SEMA. Really? Yeah, because uh, uh, now because I because uh, Jonathan that you had on from Icon, he came and joined us for dinner. It's and, uh, uh not at all what obviously no, it's what basic. you think, but it's like old school Vegas, like Oh, almost kind of like seats. a, a Dude, deer path in the place. In my, when I met my buddy out in Vegas, I'm trying to think what the hell the name was. He took me like way off the beaten path. And it was like, same thing, like old school Vegas steak joint. Ponderosa? No, the, it was, it was like the, the decor <laughs> was kind of like, what the hell was the name of the place? Man? Isn't the one in Circus Circus is just called steak. It's called the it? steakhouse. The steakhouse. The yeah. steakhouse in Circus Circus. So you go in, it's, it's leather seats. Um, all the bartender or all the waiters are in white shirts, black ties. And the first time I went there, I went with the guys from River City Rods in Iowa. And they come over and go, the steak today was comes from this ta- comes from Davenport, oh, yeah. Iowa. And those guys came from Davenport, <laughs> Iowa. So somewhere along the way, they probably passed the steak. But you go in, it's like it's legit. Like Houston used to have a place like that too. It's called the Strip House. And you would go in, it's all black leather uh, booths. And then on the walls, old go-go dancer posters on it. And it was the coolest place. But it's another one of those places it was open for a while. And then the guy that had it went and opened something else. And But it was like just atmosphere and stuff. It's like you felt like a man going in there and getting a steak. And it was it was expensive, but you got what you were paid for. It. Dude, this you is know? the Golden Steer Steakhouse. Oh, that place is great. Yeah, and yeah. since 1958. Yep, I've and been there. That place is, and it's good. Oh, oh so good. Yep. Yeah, yeah, the ambiance, the decor, and that. Have you place? ever done that little awesome. Italian restaurant there in Vegas? Everybody goes to where like the wine is free, and then I've like heard about it. We've yeah, never, I've never been. So I've I've went to that several times, and it's so cheesy, and it's like. But every time someone invites you to go, you're like, yeah, I'll go. <laughs> Have you done bizarre meats? Oh yeah, I've done bizarre meats. I went that with the Kelderman guys. So, so <clears throat> I'm notorious for I can't afford any of this stuff, but. You just got to go with the right people. Well, you got to go right. with the right people. So, yeah. so a good story. Like <laughs> another reason why seeing Slice downstairs is like seeing an old friend. Well, I had dinner with those guys with oh, the Terzages, the Paisan boys. Yeah, the Paisan boys <laughs> and uh, Denny and Mike, and so and it was my wife and my brother in law, and um, so we're all they're like, "Come on, get in this Uber. You'll come with us." And I'm like, so I'm all like looking like cheap. We go to like Joe's Crab, you know, and it's like you look at cheap steaks like sixty eight dollars on there, and I'm all like, and then Mike's like don't worry about it. We got this. And I'm like, Oh, well in that case, <laughs> no, no. but like those guys are like, yeah, we need like six lobsters to the table and all this other stuff. And it's like, it's so great to get on somebody else's 
dime, you know, because oh, it's yeah. like, and like, we didn't really even order. And I, I ordered the cheapest steak there and it was still amazing, you know, and it's, but it's, if you can hop on that, because we did the, uh, so the, there's a famous Japanese restaurant, Momofuku. Um, they have that too. And we did the one where you go in, it's how much a person, well, Kelderman's paid for that. And it was, I think we did 180 bucks a person. And then it starts and me and JC wanted to go there and we recommend it. So it's all these farm raised guys from Iowa and then it comes out and all of a sudden it's like, here's this little piece of this little piece of that. And I'm starting to worry. And I was like, cause the guy, Kyle, that does their tech stuff for us, he's a big boy. And I'm like, Oh, I was like, Kyle's going to, I'm going to have to take Kyle for a steak after this. Then all of a sudden they come out with these prawns. We got one of those Kyles too. (laughs) Then all of a sudden they come out with prawns. Like they're like this big, you know, like, and they're just, and that's, oh, this is half an order. And you're like, and it's like, but it got really amazing. Like they're only how sake and everything like that. Like it was amazing. And it was, it was great food, but that's, that's the only reason to go to Vegas. It's not same us to go eat food. We really need to put together like a car show dining dining recommendation, like, for all the places we've been, you know, we like Texas, good guys, Texas. What's Babe's Chicken? Babe's and I mean, that's, Heart Eight. Right. Awesome yeah. places. I mean, you really do come across these. Well, Panther things. City there in neat Fort places. Worth got named number one barbecue in Texas by Texas Monthly this month. So that's not that far from the Speedway either. And uh, Panther City, huh? Yeah. And yeah, you're right. They're like a, a pamphlet. Or I think yeah. just follow a, John on Instagram yeah. and yeah. see where he went. Well, well, if you guys are buying, you know, I'll just hop in the car with you. <laughs> <laughs> this well, is he my, made the uh, recommendation for the gas station barbecue. Oh, Rudy's? Yeah. Rudy's. Yeah. Yeah, I, I thought Rudy's was great. Yeah, we we did that. shredded. <laughs> well, we, yeah, we talked about it on uh, like so, the podcast. People were like, you can't believe you think Rudy's is good. Just, just so those people can just screw off because everybody recommends, oh, go to Franklin's. Why well, don't want to stay in line for three hours to get a piece yeah. of brisket? And it's like when you get to Texas and – the brisket's here. It's like getting really good bourbon. Like from your, your seven to your 10 on your bourbon list, they're all good bourbons. Right. And that's the way the barbecue is. So like truth is like, that's pappy. You know, that's the old stuff you can't buy anymore. That's truth barbecue. That's corkscrew in North Houston, Tyler's and Amarillo. If you ever get a chance to go there, that, that place there is amazing. But there's those places exist. How does the big Texan compare? No, the big Texan sucks. <laughs> but what about Terry Blacks? <laughs> Terry Blacks is good. I like yeah. Terry Blacks. Yeah, Terry Blacks like is it. great. So I'll tell you. So uh, <clears throat> I went to Deuce reunion with the guys from Bruce's Rod Shop once, and I'd never been to um, Bastrop to go to barbecue. And then the, the original Blacks is there, and it even has 1932 in the block up there. And you walk in, you're on a wood floor. There's pictures of Lyndon Johnson eating barbecue in there. That's how, you know, that's, and it's, and it looks just as dusty in the pictures as it does while you're in there now. And I just recently moved there from Florida and from, and I've been in Houston, Houston to Austin and barbecue is a little bit of a difference. And, um, so I go in and I'm used to ordering like half a rack of ribs. Well, don't do that when it comes to beef ribs because they charge <laughs> you by the pound. And like, if you get one rib, that's just like 30 bucks. So a half rack would be like 120 bucks or something like that. But luckily the guy goes, I don't think you want that. And I'm like, and all of a sudden he lifts this rib and this thing's, it looks like a turkey leg and it's just a brisk. And I got it. But once you've had one of those beef ribs, oh, but yeah, Terry Black's, you can't beat Terry Black's either. And then, and usually the line's not too bad at Terry Black's either. What do you think about Dreamland in Birmingham? I have not done Dreamland. I have not done Dreamland, but I will put Saw's Saw's, Soul Food up against anything. Saw's Juke Joint. If he's never taken you guys to that. Not. We should just get in the van and go to Birmingham now. <laughs> go to Saws Birmingham. is good. Good joint. Yeah. yeah, Saws is great. The the place. Um, you know who had help in opening Saws? Mm. Uh, Taylor Hicks from. Oh really? Uh, way back in the day on American Idol. Really? Yeah. The awesome. White haired old guy. Yeah. Yeah. Birmingham, I think, is oh, just, yeah. <laughs> just a little nugget. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You Something that you would know. That. Would know. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I, th- I think Birmingham f- Birmingham's an underrated town as far as food and just in general being out. Not a lot of great you know? people come out of there, though. No, you know? Not at all, it, especially around the Hueytown area. I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> those, those guys down there at Goulds be great dudes, but like, yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. Other than Man, that, I was <laughs> driving to Goolsby's the other day to shoot the van and the Camaro. And I don't know if you've been there or not. Well, you come off the interstate and there's like a little windy two lane road and then it opens up into four lane and then you make a right to go in the shop. Well, there's a curve with a red light and like a church or something there. I'm in the Sprinter at like 10 o'clock at night and the lights red starts are slowing down. All of a sudden his car goes right past me on the left. And I'm like, and it's a blind curve. And I'm like, yeah, like 
I guess. <laughs> I was like, but, so yeah. you're doing all these, uh, you're doing all these shows. You're going to Heat Wave. You're going to Greenville. Yeah. Um, you're Josh, dropping d- knowledge. Doing all yeah. those shows. Yeah. What? Where? How do you get to, you know, Street Rodder or any of these other, you know, <clears throat> so, large hot rod magazines? So luckily, guys that are really good at building mini trucks wind up building hot rods. Because that's how that's, I met Troy from BBT. Yeah, that's that's, that's definitely how I met Jonathan. Trying, like a gateway drug. Right? It's like a great gateway drug, yeah. Well, because... So I started with an 82 Ford Ranger as my first vehicle, and we chopped the springs on it. Of course, it's I-beams, so it wears the tires. So every three months, I'm rotating the tires to the back, then running the back ones to the front. And then three months later, I'll take the ones in the back and then flip them around. So you see worn tire on the outside, but, but, that's, not, good. but that's not touching the asphalt, yeah. so you don't have to worry <laughs> about it. And But it's cool. And then, like, of course, everybody in New York's into, like, muscle cars and stuff like that. And they're like, we're well, just a dumb kid, but... But that's what got me into trucks is one of my buddies' dad bought him a square body Chevy. And then in the shop uh, at our school, they painted it and lowered it, put a Bell Tech kit on it, put interior in it. And then they wind up helping me paint my Ranger. And um, and then that was my start, you know. And then that list went into a long list of me building mini trucks and cutting roofs off of cars and doing stupid stuff that I shouldn't have done and ruining cars overall. <laughs> but, you know, but uh, but it, it made a lot of friends. And then a lot of those guys, and then I started developing my own style because even before technically it was possible to light cars on location like I do now, uh, I used to take the four by eight sheets of aluminum, um, like sided uh, foam core, I remember cut them into four by four, <laughs> and I would hold those and then bounce light across <clears throat> the grill and off the side. So even when I couldn't light stuff, I was trying to light stuff. And then we got into long exposure and we'd pop a flash and run around almost like light painting now. Um, so what'd you do to always get a thunderstorm in the background? Ah, I'm just lucky. Mother nature (laughs) follows me everywhere I go. In fact, I think, uh, in fact, Lone Star Throwdown this year, the last three or four years, it's just been crappy, rainy, cold. And they were calling for 80 degrees and sunny. And I text them. I'm like, how much if I just stay away? (laughs) I was like, I figured they just pay me to stay away, but we had a beautiful weekend this year. And it's, and that's, I would still rather go to Lone Star Throwdown instead of going to Detroit. So I figure I got to at least throw one jab at Detroit because that seems to be the going theme of shows on, on the on the podcast now. So. Yeah, there's been some yeah. shots fired. Shots fired. <laughs> yeah, so. I don't think we're welcome. Yeah, I don't, eh, don't want to go. I, in fact, I stopped going years ago, and then I've even been offered money to go. But, you know, Detroit kind of got me to where I'm at because, you know, I started driving a Corvair van. My wife bought me a Corvair van when we were engaged for my birthday. So we test drove it seven miles, drove it home 480 miles to Florida. <laughs> it was primered. I bought it from Greg Porter out of Greenville, South Carolina. It was a hot rod shop there. And he had bought it just to take the motor out of to put in one that he had that was already lowered. And um, so we bought it. Um, and then I basically drove that sucker 170,000 miles in four years going to car shows, all 102 horsepower of it. Damn. And so that kind of got me to where I am now because, you know, I was developing a style that no one liked at the time of lighting stuff and making stuff super dramatic. And of course, everything's kind of come to that way now, <laughs> but, and, uh, but you know, all those relationships I made sleeping on people's couches. Cause like my Sprinter van has a shower and a bed in it, but my Corvair van was the doors didn't even lock, didn't have heat or AC. So I went to, <laughs> I went to Detroit one year and Dustin Ford worked for Bobby Alloway at the time. Everybody called him ACE. And uh, PPG at the time, uh, Jeremy from Lucky Strike and Jim Kavatic were at one of the Columbus shows, and they had been following me online. Probably, I think it was MySpace at the time. And then they go, hey, aren't you that Knotstock guy? And, I, and, of course, my van was blue. and had a big Knotstock logo on the side of it, and it was before we bagged it. And uh, I was like, oh, I am. And um, so I met Jim and Jeremy, and they in- introduced me to Christina from PPG. And then she goes, you know, we've got some stuff we'd like to do for posters, and I, we need to do some stuff with Bobby Alloway. And then that Detroit prior, I'd had no one did metal prints back then. I had I had a custom sign guy that did metal prints for me. It wasn't even a print shop that did it then. And uh, it was pulling teeth to get him to make anything for me. But when he did, the stuff was amazing. And so I was at Detroit. I drove my Corvair van. I left Houston in basketball shorts, Crocs, and a T-shirt. It was 90 degrees. And then by the time I got to Missouri, it was 11. So I'm pulling clothes out and stuffing it in the vents. And then I had buddies pass me on the way to Detroit and they're like, how are your windows not fogged up? I was like, well, it's just as cold inside as it is outside. <laughs> and uh, so I get to Detroit. I'm in the basement with all the artists. Like I get to be there with Max Grundy and Keith Wiesner. And, and I'd been going to round up with these guys and stuff. So I'd made friends with them. And it was just like, 
I was in awe of being able to hang out with these great artists, you know, and then Tony Squindo, which does artwork for Metallica. He's the one that actually designed my camera logo and everything like that. Like that guy's amazing, but he's one of my best friends. And, um, but so I wind up in the basement down there and then people, and then Alloway walks by or Dustin brings him down and shows him my work. And Bobby just loves the stuff on the metal prints. And, uh, and of course it's all crazy lit and everything like that. And he goes, well, PPG needs to do some stuff with me. And I'm like, all right, cool. And then I talked to Christine and she's like, oh, just go. So I, I'm basically paid for one day to go to Alloway's and I stay for two weeks and shoot everything he's got and uh, wound up doing a couple posters. And then while I was doing the poster, the camera that I had, the poster, the resolution wasn't big enough for the poster. So that led me into using medium format cameras, which cost me like $30,000 for a camera body. It was still in film Ooh. days before. No, no, this was still, this was digital. So that's why it was so expensive at the time because it was new, but it was like, you know, that to get something that was 40 or 50 megapixel, you had to spend 10 to $30,000. Like the camera I shoot now is 102 megapixel, but it's 10 grand and it's fast like a regular camera. But back then you're like, click, click. And like everybody now is like, <laughs> you know, when they shoot stuff. So I'm like hanging out of cars doing rolling shots with this $30,000 camera with a $6,000 lens on it, you know, and it's do you like, do you tether that thing to your person? Yeah. So <laughs> I, 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 I would actually have like a wrist strap on it. So if like I dropped it, but, but it's amazing when you pay some that much for something like that, how hold tight on you hold tighter. on to Cause if I would have fell out of a car, I would have hit the ground first. There's no, I like, I would, I would, <laughs> tuck, tuck, tuck and roll. I would protect my, my, I would, I would break the fall of the camera with my head. Cause like my head could take the hit. I don't know if the camera could. Recently on Change Agents with Andy Stumpf, an Ironclad original from executive producer Jack Carr. Andy sat down with author Siddharth Kara to discuss the horrors of modern cobalt mining. These people suffer enormous violence. So there are hundreds of thousands of some of the poorest people in the world, including tens of thousands of children, digging cobalt out of the ground. Never miss an episode. Subscribe to Change Agents with Andy Stumpf wherever you get your podcasts and get the full cinematic experience on YouTube at This Is Ironclad. But so I, I got, it was just right place at right time. And like I was in Detroit that year, but if I wouldn't have been, that was the year Bobby was the builder of the year. So if, you know, I'd had the word of mouth but until people actually saw a lot of the work. And then, you know, of course with social media blowing up, then it was easier to get my work out and let people see it. But then I started doing PPG posters and doing ads and metal prints and all this other stuff. Then I start working for good guys. And now it's like, I don't have to find work. Now it's almost more like I have to turn down work, which is, it's good and it's bad because I just, I, so last year I drove 73,000 miles and photographed 231 cars. And the year before that was 262 cars and 68,000 miles. And, um, and I never really knew cause everybody always asked me how many cars do you think you've shot over your life? I was like, I have not a clue. I just take pictures of cars, you know? And then when I started doing YouTube at the end of the year, recap that first year, I was like, holy crap. But like, sometimes I'll shoot 11 cars for good guys in a weekend, but I still have to do them good. I can't just, Oh, over click, click, all right, next, click, click, next. It's like, so when I shoot the five finalists, they still have to be good pictures, you know? So it's like, I legit shot 200 and however many cars I do every year. And it's like, but that's cool. You know, I, I like that, but it's, it's, uh, well, what's your criteria? I mean, how do you dismiss stuff or how do you take stuff other than like good guys hiring you or some magazine hiring you? If you're out on your own, is it something that just has to appeal to you? Is it your style? So is, it, is it the money? Is it what is money is always good, but it's never what seems to motivate me, which is like, again, the chagrin of my wife. Cause she would <laughs> much rather take the fucking money. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a billionaire in New York. I, I do work for and whatever the amount is, he'll write me a check for it you know, but I don't like going there and shooting cars. You know, it's like one of those ones. And, and we can edit that out for you. No, it's fine. Does it make you do like weird stuff? No, it's just, it's just like, now do it with the shirt off. I have (laughs) now two dragons. Be a tiger. (laughs) But it's one of those ones. Like, so I, I have this love for 63 to 65 Rivieras and what got me into custom cars. And I, I should probably tell this story is uh, I was really into mini trucks and that's all I cared about. And one day I'm in a, looking at a car stereo magazine and Jimmy Vaughn's Riviera is in there, the gold metal flake with the wire wheels on it that Gary Howard built. And um, so when we first moved to Houston, Gary Howard's built it. See, Autorama has done some good things. So the Houston Autorama, <laughs> Gary Howard was builder of the year. So walking down the aisle is Jimmy Vaughn 
Gary Howard and Gary Howard's nephew. And my wife always tells the story, like, I don't really fanboy much over anything, but everything I like in a car was because of Gary Howard, like his style, like, like that rivy has a three quarter of an inch chop on it. And unless you set it next to a rivy, like that, yeah, it's perfect. It's got white tuck and roll. It actually has a stereo on it. It's got true spokes, right? Got true spokes on it. Yeah. Like to me, it's like, that's about as perfect as it. Plus I like gold metal flakes. And they just like tucked that car away somewhere randomly at Detroit. I remember. Yeah. I saw it was just like sitting off with like, yep. The common folks over yeah. there. Yeah, it's, it's so sad. And, uh, but that's what got me in. That's exact. Everything I like in a car is that car. And, um, so I basically not the guy who taught Stevie Ray Vaughan how to play guitar over to meet Gary Howard. And my wife goes, he, she always tells like this. Oh, Hey Gary Howard. It's so good to meet you. Everything I like in cars. Cause you, I was like, I don't talk like that, <laughs> but that's <laughs> one of her favorite stories. But, uh, but yeah, so, you know, everything I like in a car was because of a certain builder. And it's like, I've gotten lucky to be friends with a lot of builders who build really great cars. And, um, Oh, that was another one. Can I, can I go back to another on the gas? You can go back is, anywhere you want to go. Brad Starks. Do you know Brad Starks? Yeah. So Brad yeah. Starks out of cool Paducah, stuff. Kentucky. So that guy there, he and I are on the same wavelength on liking cars. And, but that dude's also built grade eight finalists and he built that bitch in Woody, Tin Woody, yeah. Tin Woody, he had a, an amazing 51 that was root beer. And then when you open the hood, it had like a billet supercharger on top of it and everything. Like the guys just, some guys just have it, you know, like anything they build, you know, it just kills. And I'm, I'm that way with Brad Starks. And, but those guys like, like that, like Brad Starks. And then like the day I realized Steve Sanford knew who I was, like, I was like, oh. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's gotta be, uh, yeah, it's one of those one moments. Like you're like, well, maybe I am somebody, <laughs> but it's cool. But yeah, like Steve Sanford, I mean, I, I grew up. Oh, so <clears throat> let's go back to my car stories as a kid too. I'm sorry. This is all over the place. <laughs> but so when I was living in the tiny home that my mom had back in the day, <laughs> we moved into the tiny home that my uncle had. And my uncle had like every hot rod magazine for like, seemed like I must have thousands of hot rod magazines. And so when I moved in, that was just left in the room that I acquired. So the closet's just stacked with hot rods, car crafts, all the other stuff. So that kind of got me subconsciously loving magazines and wanting to do stuff for magazines my whole life is that stack. Other than my mom stealing all the heavy metals out of it, the, uh, the cartoons. <laughs> I remember but, heavy metal. Yeah, the heavy metals. But, like, I, I mean, I had legit, like, great Hot Rod magazines, all the Prudhomme covers, all the other stuff. And But going back to your question of the stuff for money or for love, it's like whenever I shoot a Riviera, my wife, she'll see me shooting a Riviera on Instagram. She'll text me and goes, so are we getting paid for this one or is this – something we're going to hang at the house. Like I just shot South city's pink Riviera. That, that's badass. I love that's, that. Car. That can be the sickest car. Yeah. Like, so built. I, lo- I, I photographed that, that one and Bill comes up to me and goes, uh, and he goes, he goes, I don't want you to take this the wrong way. I'm, I <clears> always <throat> wanted you to shoot one of my cars and I'm, I'm glad that you're shooting this. And he goes, but what are you shooting this for? It's already been shot for this. It's already been shot for that. So I was like, well, it's either gonna be my bathroom wall or the bedroom. <laughs> I was like, cause it'll be a pink. And, <laughs> and he's like, that's the best place for this car is to be in the bathroom. And I was like, and cause my wife actually wants my prints on there. And I'm one of those people that like three months after I shot some, I'll look at the picture. And I'm like, Oh, I hate that. I should have done something different, you know? And, um, but we're always our own worst critics. And, um, but it was just one of those ones that like, I found an old <clears throat> closed Toys R Us with that one. So like the rainbow comes down and lands right on top of the car from the old Toys R Us oh, building. So we like, we drove all over that area in North Calories that we're looking at these iconic church buildings and all this other stuff, like stuff that's period correct with it. And I'm like, no, my dumb ass shoots it in front of a closed down Toys R Us. That's but then when I talked cool. to Bill, Bill goes, I kind of like it there. It's like, I would have never thought about it. And he's yeah. like, but that makes it the fact that you did it, you know? And that's my thing is like finding cool, odd backgrounds to stick stuff in. I just well, can't what, get enough of that damn car. Yeah, car. Anytime, anytime, anytime you see that car, it's like, you just double take and you have yeah. to go back. And so, you like, know, he drove that to Oklahoma for gathering at the rock, right? No, I didn't so know. he left California, drove it to gathering at the rock and drove it back. Dang. Yeah. We're going to have to go to this gathering show. Dude, you guys yeah. got to come to gathering Keep hearing the rock. good stuff. about. So it. last year we did a belt buckle for best trophy. Cool. So, yeah. So I found a place, a silversmith outside of new Braunfels that basically put the gathering logo with the Buffalo and the hot rod. They put it on a rodeo belt buckle. But every, so like this year, Corey Talbert made a hat out of aluminum, a cowboy hat. Yeah, saw that. Like, and then somebody had a propeller and then it was, and then uh, the guys from Steve Cook's, 
did the skateboard deck on a custom billet stand and all this other stuff. Yeah, all and the trucks were hand engraved. All the trucks were hand engraved. Yeah, Alan, sh- shout out to Alan Childers that works for Steve Cook. That guy there, he's going to be, I mean, he already is somebody, but one day everybody's gonna, everybody's going to want to hire Alan for something. Yeah, I'm so. going gonna, gonna to try to reach out and get some some office artwork from oh, yeah. him. He does some cool shit. Yeah, he's, he's I got to give him a hard time, though, because he, uh, he's been working on um, his 60s car, and supposedly next year for the gathering, he's going to try and break it out. And I told him if he breaks it out, I'll break the Corvair van back out because it's at my buddy's shop, Octane Iron in oh, Houston. Wow. But my roof just peeled on it because the guy who had it before them left it sitting outside in in Houston for like six months while they're building the motor for it. That's a tough climate. Yeah, so it got moisture up underneath the roof and the roof lifted. So, Well, it's funny. I was, my, my takeaway when you're talking about doing all this, you're shooting this car and trying to find this look. From you talking about how bad of a work ethic you had previously – that's something we've known each other for quite some time and been on a lot of shoots together and stuff. And that's something above most all with a few exceptions, most <laughs> other photographers that are out there. It is, it doesn't matter the time of day. It doesn't matter what other places. It's just kind of like, yeah, we'll figure that out. We'll do this. You just roll with the punches and there's never like a, ah, uh, you know what? It's a little late. We didn't get to this one or I can't find a spot or the weather's not great. Can we do it tomorrow? There's a lot of that out there in that community where it's just like, oh, no, well, maybe we'll get it the next time. But I mean, even from in Columbus with the giveaway truck, I mean, it was we were <laughs> we were gonna, a little we were a little late. I was going to be nice were about you? that. We were, little, were we? I mean, so, just the a pictures little. Pictures came up. So you want to see? It from, <laughs> you want to see it from my side of the story? Where, where were the fuck were we? Where, I, what, where were we? I get a text going. they will be here at <laughs> seven, and I'm like, oh no! Originally, I think it was gonna be six because I like, oh well, sunset. Okay, fine. We'll shoot up on top of the building. Yeah. The next thing I know at seven, I'm like, so six o'clock. And they're like, oh, they said they're on their, they're almost here. And then what was it like 1030? Oh, yeah, Cause we were, we were driving straight there. Yeah. Yes. You were driving. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But also I had a middleman too. So I'm just getting told yeah. by this other well, person. Well, you know, that's like the tables have turned every once in a while. The <laughs> photographer has to wait for the <laughs> photographer. <laughs> it's fine. Fee? What do you call it? The, the subject. Dude, I've shot. We were we were trying to build a free truck, so. Dude, right. I've shot so <laughs> many vehicles yeah. missing parts and have builders go, "Can you just not get the back of the car in the picture?" I'm like, yeah, "We'll make it work." Yeah. I'm, I'm Captain Wing it. We'll make no matter what. We'll make it work. We'll make it presentable. Right. You know, and I've had so many. Hey, we're leaving for SEMA in three days. Can you shoot this without the rear chin or without the yeah. rear spoiler on it? Sure. We'll just shoot this angle. You yeah, know? we get those where you've got to like submit a picture for something for SEMA, yeah. and you're like, it's two weeks away, so the car should be done, but it's like just coming out of the paint shop. So yeah. you Will like, you take a rendering? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know why they wouldn't. Cause you're like, Hey, we're debuting this. Yeah. We don't want people to see it yet. Yeah. yeah but yeah. anybody who'll paint a 25 foot long sprinter van in 26 days and have it ready for SEMA, you know, I mean, it's like hot hats that's off to a, those that's dudes. Ambitious. Yeah. I started, I started taking that thing apart and they go, what the hell are you doing? And I'm like, I'm just helping. And they're like, you're going to stay here for the next 30 days. You can go take pictures in the next week or so to pay for this. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to go take pictures. We'll stop touching stuff. I'm like, all right. So they wouldn't let me help on anything on the Sprinter. Talking about your mini house, I just want to get a little backstory. Is that Was that a single mini house or a double mini house? Oh, the one, my mom's double mini house? Yeah. The, the, the tiny house I was lived it, in? No, it was a single okay. and it had the nice rollout windows. <clears throat> I actually miss those rollout windows on those single wide trailers. So you would probably know. this is You've traveled around an, enough and you also grew up a certain way. You, you know about used tire stores, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. So these guys did not know anything about used tire stores. And we're, we're on a road tour years and years ago. We pass a bright blue cinder block building with the yellow trim and, or it's a red one. You know, yeah. they're all bright oh, yeah. colors, right? Well, that's a used tire store. And so and then they're asking me like, why we see these used, it says used tires. What is, what is the deal with that? And like, it can't be any clear, like <laughs> yep. exactly what it says is used tires. So, and so now it's, it's been a joke between so all funny of us. Story it, it, it didn't like register. Like how just, do you take it, off a tire and then resell it? Cause it's bad. Yeah. That's well, it might be bad for you, yeah. <laughs> but it might be good for somebody else. Well, so, so somebody, somebody scored like on my sprinter on the way to Florida, put new tires on, I blew an inside tire. So I had to buy a brand new, whatever the cheapest tire was on that side. So that tire, when I put my other six tires on that matched, I'm not putting that cheap tire on the inside that I bought. So somebody got a tire with like 150 miles on it. I'm sure they didn't throw it away. 
but they probably still sold that as a most most tire shops. I mean, discount won't. But that's but not the majority of the used no, tire no. business. <laughs> the, if, we, in fact, you know what? We should just get in a bus, go to Houston, eat barbecue, and look at used tire places. Because <laughs> Houston has the best on the planet for we, used tire We should pack places. up a, a 48 foot trailer full of all the damn tires we have here and take them down there. Because oh, yeah. here in Illinois, you can't get rid of tires. No, you to pay try to, to get up. rid of a tire yeah. is I virtually also impossible. Don't think you're selling used 335 tires to anybody. They'll figure it out. Yeah, you put a, well, a two, well, two wheels to I bet there's some truck guys down there the, in Houston will buy those. The <laughs> width and aspect ratio doesn't matter near as much. No. You can fit a, you could probably, you'd be yeah. surprised. You put it on a 335 on an eight inch rim. Exactly. It's 20. Yeah, it's fine. Got a little bulge to her. Yeah. That's so funny story with the used tire places. Um, so my Corvair van, right after it got painted the first time, we went to this show called Heavy Roll Weekender in uh, Winston-Salem. And it's a rockabilly concert in an old jail. And uh, so we're driving back, and I have a flat in the on the interstate in the middle of some, nowhere in South Carolina. Well, we pull off the interstate, and there's a sign that says, Mike's Tire. It doesn't say tires, <laughs> anything like that. Get, and it's on a rock. You get a uh, tire. <laughs> it's on a rock. And we go there, and he had a used tire that fit on, that was my Corvair van size. So we got a tire on, got back on the road. So yeah. My only experience with a used tire wasn't a good one. No. I had it. That, I, I mean, doubt many of them are. Yeah, the old, that 91 Suburban, that was just a rot box. And I'm down in Florida with the thing. And all I needed uh. to do was pull a trailer. And this thing, it had, the tires had, like, been in the heat. And they'd, like, balloon blown up and i'm like yank the wheel running around town i'm like dude just give anything like give me anything that will fit on this rim it's a very standard like 15 inch rim any i don't care how big how small how worn out it is just a tire that holds air two-wheel drive or four-wheel drive two-wheel drive they would not do just it done. that's usually what the guys <laughs> well, are there are you like, automatic it's a, or it's, manual it's a yeah. lot <laughs> yeah it's a liability you know we can't give you this it could you know the tread could come off it could blow you out know where you could, could sell those outside the burnout pit the hoonigans thing at sema <laughs> oh, yeah, they had some trouble there. Yeah, that was my buddy's truck that got the, uh, I had shot it for street trucks that got the tire on the roof. They take, Solomon? Yeah. They take care oh, of that? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, not, not Solomon blowing, that, Solomon's crazy. But uh, that that one that, that like, Chevy truck that almost was inside the Did they yeah. take care of that truck? I was told no, but I haven't talked to him <clears> in a little bit. But the guy that owns that truck is salt of the earth. And he used to work for Wicked Fab up there and, and uh, super great guys. And they built that truck in his dad's shop and like, they're over the road, like gravel truck shop. And that truck's as good as any of those trucks built, you know? Oh, yeah. uh, the tire's not that the, good. Though. Well, the tire that came off of that piece of crap challenger with a wrap on it, yeah. you know? Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. That was the one that's that received what, the that's, yeah. <clears throat> tire. So yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. They got lucky on that one. Yeah, they did. Yeah. Cause if you go three foot over, you're on Vinny's truck. Yeah. And you go another three foot from that, you're on top you're, of revisions truck. Or you 10 or foot short crowd. and you're in the crowd. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. The crowd would have. Yeah. You sign a waiver, but there's ways around waivers. If you hit someone in the face with a retread, yeah. you know, you know, talking about used tires is uh, one of the, I know I've got <laughs> this a stories. lot. Yeah. So a lot here, yeah. so what another thing, here. the first fast thing I ever saw, cause everybody talks about Camaros and drag cars and Bonneville and stuff is, I don't know if you remember back in the day, Tyrone Malone and the super boss, like Peterbilt and Kenworth they had. No. So all those came to, you'll have to look. What is, up. what is back in the day? Oh, like, like back when we were passing each other on covered wagons okay. so in the middle of Missouri, yeah. late forties. So, so the super boss truck is, um, so Tyrone Malone used to build all these just basically burnout semis with like big wings on the back of them and stuff. So okay. they used retreads used to be, used to be big in the semi industry cause they would recap tires. Yeah, still yeah. pretty big. Yeah. So I'm, I'm pretty sure yeah. it's probably still is. So, so like, so the black truck is actually in, yeah. So this dude here, like that's America awesome. right there. Yeah. That's Tyrone oh, alone. Oh man. So the, uh, that's a rebel model. Like yeah. every one of those could be the picture. Yeah, so of when I show up, is. yeah, there is one up there. Yeah. So when I was a kid, so that cab over there would that hold the super sick. boss. And then that black truck there would hold the band, 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 band bandit. So my grandfather got tires at the Bandag dealer in uh, crater tire in Jackson, Missouri. Someone needs to build and, that. Yeah. So that was a real thing. That is a real thing. And the black truck's actually in the Iowa 80 Museum. So if you go to Iowa 80 Truck Stop, it's in the museum. But so when I go there, all that stuff's there. He had another rig that they lived in. Yeah, so that, see that boss truck? Like that one pulled the sleeping quarters. They had a Corvette that was done up like a police car. Then they had all this other stuff. But I, I, was, I got it. I can't. That's what I, forget <laughs> yeah. about the trucks. Like yeah. I'm most interested in Tyrone Malone. Tyrone Malone's right awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's legit. 
So somehow yeah. these all wound up in Australia and got restored in Australia. For really? burnout competitions. Yeah. yeah, I guess so. But yeah, like, so like they used to race these trucks against each other big, you know, because I think. You think that's a hand stitch logo right there? Oh, or? I'm sure. I think that's actually, <laughs> is that a sure cake? It's easy, <laughs> it does like, look like an icing <laughs> on a cake. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I want for my birthday. If anybody listens to this, I want a Tyrone Malone cake. <laughs> But yeah, look at that thing. Yeah, that's pretty rare. But they were they were legit. And then they, were, they wound up other people building semis to drag race against him. And he's got his name in on raised tires. white letters yep. on tires. Yep. Like an innovator. Yeah, so he started out with, see this one here? See little Irvy? Go back down a little bit, that blue truck. Where? Go go so, up. Sorry. No. Get, we, yeah. So little Irvy. So like, he they bought a whale. And then. It's got white walls on it. Yeah, so they bought a whale. <laughs> That was inside this trailer and hauled this whale all over the country. An actual whale? An actual whale. Was and it called Little Irvy? It was called Little Irvy. <laughs> but then he, he, and so he wound up building these other trucks because that truck, more people wanted to look at the truck than they wanted to look at the whale that was inside the well, truck. What are you doing with the whale? I mean, <laughs> face, was the whale yeah, see, alive? See, it says it on the 20 ton, 20 ton, 38 foot whale, in, whale inside. See the giant from the Pacific. Wow. It's like a stuffed whale? Oh, you you got to understand. It might have been stuff, but entertainment I, I was a little different back yeah, then. But, yeah, kids didn't have Instagram. You're going to go out and see a whale. If <laughs> <when> Little <laughs> Irvy's coming to town, you're going to line up in back, the Kmart parking lot to see it. it must back have when Josh and I were little era. kids, that was our Netflix. That was entertainment. Huh? They let's didn't look, even know what the Joey Chitwood experience was let's about. Look, let's about. Little Irvy and chill. Me and Phil were playing Super Nintendo, and you guys are looking at Little Irvy. But that's what got me into fast cars. Was was the semi stuff here. That's pretty sick. Yeah. No, it's all cheater cool slicks in the front. Yeah. But I still, uh, I recently shot, I have a buddy. You want to talk about people who work their ass off. Um, but my buddy Evan owns a metal polishing company that polishes wheels for semis. And every time you go to his That's Instagram feed, that, that dude's black. just black. Yeah. But he has the baddest, um, like day cab stretch Peterbilt ever and that's another one my wife's like uh so uh how much you get paid for this one i was like oh i made a youtube video <laughs> <laughs> i think while you're out here like our peterbilt would look great dude kind of like i'm above so the bed. happy you haven't wrapped that because i remember when you first got it you're like oh we're gonna wrap it and i was like oh you're gonna ruin it yeah but we're gonna wrap yeah. it something like that yeah it was gonna be badass like be stripes. Yeah, but it looks so good i mean yeah. at least for the first year because it's been it's been over a year now right yeah but yeah. it looks so good like because when you look at hill's truck that all red yours next to it looks just as good all white. So my son yesterday, he's talking about it, and he came up with the idea. He says, don't wrap the outside. You should wrap the entire inside of it. Like, that's a pretty good idea. Well, that's what Hills has. Yeah, Hills, you ever seen the inside yeah, of Hills it? did it. Yep. And it's cool. That's one thing I've got from this podcast kid's is you, your kid's the future, man. He's oh, got, he's, he's got, he's good got taste. great ideas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had to stop playing video games because I started doing Forza and stuff like that. Next thing you know, it's like, when did they get dark outside? <laughs> it's like, because it's a you straight time travel. On like when you get into a good race game, you're like, oh yeah, it's like, oh yeah, I can't play video games anymore. They're just, I just don't have the skills. Yeah, that's yeah. what I got. They're too damn well, those, challenging. Those, uh, me. those, what well, they call first person shooters. When you do this, you're like, oh, I'm out of it. Yeah. <laughs> like we used to have three buttons and yeah. a joystick. Now there's like fucking buttons everywhere and joysticks, keypads. Yeah, and no little Irving. Yeah, no, and no Irving, all that. Right? No, no twenty foot whale being <laughs> little Irving the game. <laughs> Can you get a little Irving in the back of the truck? <laughs> but uh, the, but sir, that's that's the very first custom thing because you know Gary Howard's um, Rivy that he did for Jimmy Vaughn, and of course the Impala he did for Mike Young. All, like all of his stuff is that style, super subtle mod, but just you can't stop looking at it. But that's what got me into that, and then of course Cadzilla. I, I went to Recycler Tour, I think, was my first ZZ Top concert, all because of the album cover for Recycler that had Cadzilla and then all the shadows of the ZZ Top guys above it. Cool. And that's that's the whole reason I got into ZZ Top was because it was, uh, was cars, you know. And it's my wife laughs at me now. I come home. I'll be gone for, let's see, I've been on the road since, what is it, March? Yeah, so I've been on the road since the end of January. And... Um, but I'll go home and I'll be, I'll call Angelo Vespi. I've done this before and be like, Hey Angelo, when's cars and coffee down here? And he's like, you want to go tomorrow? <laughs> and I'll go to, uh, and we'll, because I got, we got back from SEMA. It's so funny how people look at stuff dif- different. So right after he won SEMA, <laughs> Detroit speed got battle the builders winner with the white Camaro. Yep. He takes the white Camaro to the cars and coffee in Jacksonville. I take JC's truck. It just got back from SEMA. And my buddy has a 66 Chevy truck that he's putting together. I mean, it's, it sets good, but it still needs work. And 
if no, not a single person looked at her truck or Angelo's Camaro, everybody just wanted to look at that truck. <laughs> it's just, I mean, it might've been because it's Jacksonville and trucks, but people like trucks. Yeah. But it was just funny. It's like you got two SEMA builds sitting here and like no one's even looking at them. Fucking SEMA car. Yeah. Have you always, I have a front drive shaft. <laughs> have you been lucky enough to only have to only be able to do automotive photography since this, or have you had to do the no wedding pictures or like Olin Mills for the kids or so when are you going to do product product shots? Photos? prom pictures? I only do glamour shots for friends. So if you guys want to do them, we can put, <laughs> we could oh, use a glamour like, shot in here. Yeah. Yep. The three of us could use an updated one because anytime we have to submit <clears throat> a picture for anything, it's yeah. like, there's like a picture that exists from, I don't know. Well, yeah. that's yeah. years and years ago. Yeah. Believe it or not, that's Chris my... has photoshopped other faces onto it or yeah. Yeah. We different do facial hair. Shots. Well, you, I sent you the one I did with Chris Ryan and Tim strange with the dem wheels are too big. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so I use, I always use my Photoshop skills for evil, but no. So this is actually, I've added this into my thing this year because a lot of builders do use headshots I've taken, but I started looking at other people's headshots going, it's my goal this year to make sure all the builders that are my friends have good headshots. Cause some, we don't, we don't have any good headshots. Well, I looked the other day and Alan Johnson's still using one. I took of him like 10 years ago. Yeah. He looks and way I'm younger like, in his. Yeah, yeah. That's probably he's why he's like still using it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's probably why. A- Angie actually still looks the same. Yeah. You know, in fact, you know, we started talking about Clyde Mays bourbon and uh, I had never had Clyde Mays until we went to their, he invited us to their Christmas party. And uh, we went to their Christmas party with barefoot and, yeah. and them. And um, they had Clyde Mays there. Clyde Mays actually surprised me. And I had, us too. well, so I had their eight year barrel strength, which was good, but like, there's that red Alabama style yeah, right, bottle right behind you. Yeah. yeah. Like that bottle's better. Yeah. Like yeah. their cheap bourbon's actually better than their good bourbon, I think. And, um, yeah, that one shot it was very surprising. Yeah. But it's got that little bit of apple taste to it. And it's, it's, I think a lot of it too is it's, 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 it's good. I don't, I'm not want to take it about being good, but it's different, yeah. you know? Cause like you get a lot of stuff like, oh, this is caramel. You know, you get a lot of that, you know, like, you, you know, automatically if someone's blending Buffalo Trace when you taste it, like when you drink Weller or you drink Buffalo Trace, you're like, you know, they're related, yeah. you know, and, but there's nothing wrong with it. They're excellent. Like for the price of that whiskey, can't beat it. But, you know, it's, it's one of those <clears> ones <throat> that, you know, it's, it, it's a good difference. In fact, when I was at Jesse Greening shooting the, uh, their AMBR contender, I was looking to see where the distillery was because I wanted to take a tour and they're building one somewhere between Jesse's shop and mobile, like in the middle of some, somewhere. Cause really? an, another big, a big conglomerate owns them now, but they're trying to bring it back to show some of that heritage of the Clyde Mays. But, uh, I definitely want to go. I want to go check that out. Cause even the Buffalo trace tours, if you haven't done it, it's, yeah, it's, we did. it's amazing. We did. We did. Pretty awesome. So I've texted the you a scale. couple of times from Buffalo trace. So right after yeah, I tried to get you to, back the sprinter van up and take a pallet of <laughs> well i sent you that barrel so we're taking the tour and then you know like the light barrels are the good barrels the ones that don't have any weight to them so we're there and there's the weller family logo on it and it's 25 years so you know what's in it mm. you know and i'm like well, we can probably take this one <laughs> but it's cool to take that tour and learn about how the black on the trees and stuff is just sugar that's fermented on the trees and stuff and um but it's it's cool to go see that because so when jc and i went I didn't make an appointment for a tour. So we show on a Sunday and there's a line and I'm like, Oh, we're not going to get a tour. Well, come to find out they released DH Taylor that day. Ooh. So everybody was in line to get H Taylor. So we were just trying to get a ticket to go in into the gift shop. And then all of a sudden I realized everybody's in line to go to the gift shop. So I get a gift shop thing and I go in, there's three bottles of H Taylor left on there. So I grab one. And then some lady comes like, goes, Hey, where'd you get that? I was like, Oh, it's on the shelf. She goes, Oh, they're all gone. So I got one. <laughs> so that's the only bottle of H Taylor we have. And the H Taylor is really good. Yeah. And, yeah. um, so then we went over there, like no one was taking a tour. So like we got a tour with like one of their best guys. And there's like That's four cool. people on the tour and that their tour guides are so good. It's like, um, so JC has vacation coming up and we're doing this, um, hogs for a cause music concert. Cause she wants to see Ian know. And, um, so we're going to go to that, but she's also sent me the map of all the distilleries <laughs> and she goes, I'd go back to North of bourbon and eat and we could go to, Go. I was like, well, they're not really near anything distillery wise, but she goes, yeah, but you don't mind driving. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. I don't mind driving. Yeah, it's only so, an hour. Yeah, it's, only got, an hour. Like, it's not a bad hour either. No, sometime this summer, there's that bourbon fest. Yeah. Concert oh, that deal music. coming up. There's some unbelievable it's artists. It's the craziest card that Black, I've seen. Black Crows will be yeah, there. We went Ava to Brothers. Uh, it's like four we're, days of anybody you yeah, can we're think going, of I think there. it's in September. M? So do you guys like the Ava Brothers? I don't Brothers? think M's there. Yeah, I, so I actually do. And like I, who? 
Avett Brothers. So I was never into them. And like some of my good friends are like super, super into them. Yeah. It fills, <laughs> it definitely fills like a void in a tip, like a certain genre of yeah. music for me. So we, we I went to it. Hinterlands in Iowa and they didn't have it the year before. So like the year we go, it's Paul Cawthon who does that cocaine country cowboy song. Yep. Um, Orville Peck's there. Shooter Jennings is there. Charlie Crockett's there. Oh, shooter. Two of your favorite. Shooter. Old back Crow back. Medicine shows there. Josh is a huge shooter fan. Stop. You know that you know that's not true. <laughs> he probably likes that new duet with Yellow Wolf then, doesn't he? Yeah. yeah. So. I was telling you about that. And yeah. Struggle, you Jet- to struggle, struggle Jennings. Oh, that one popped up on my Instagram. <laughs> that day. I was like, what is this? You want to talk about a couple guys rolling over in their graves. <laughs> oh, yeah. About their kin next to kin, <laughs> yeah. what they're doing But the now. thing is, though, Good is like grief. shooter doing <laughs> his dad <laughs> is amazing. Yeah. But Shooter doing his shooter own is just, and I'm sure he has a fan base. And it's his like his first album was the Jet. Yeah. Oh yeah, dude, it was like yeah. it was like reincarnation of Waylon. But I totally get it because when you look at it like this, is you know Shooter probably wanted to be a musician, but he didn't want to be Waylon Jennings. But you it's know? a good yeah, but, damn thing. Yeah, no, but, <laughs> but, but the thing I'm is, though, like, he has the voice to be Waylon Jennings. But, he but played hey, Waylon Jennings in the you Cash are movie. Opening a dangerous can of worms because Hank, Hank Jr. had the same situation going on. He didn't yeah. want to be like, but Hank, Hank Williams is a fucking badass. But Hank <laughs> Jr. and Hank the third is badass. Yeah, Hank the third. If you ever seen him in concert, that dude's legit. Never seen you him know? in. Con- I've always wanted. Oh, it's a amazing. Huge, I've been yeah. listening to Hank the third since like the nineties. Yeah. When he first We've came been lucky out. to see him. And then even his... Um, so his, what it, What was Shooter's problem then? So Hank <laughs> Jr. So, did it. Hank the third did it. I mean, you said it best. Josh. But you know the I thing would, is, I would though, quote you. He should have been better. Yeah. But when Hank Jr. started being Hank Jr., they... He fucked up his face. Well... I hurt my face. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my face. I hurt he my was face. trying to protect his camera when he fell out of the back of the car. <laughs> no, but seriously, when Hank Jr. started being Hank Jr., no one liked Hank Jr. being Hank Jr. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, but you know, I mean, I, I know when you want to be an artist, sometimes you go too far the wrong way, Yeah. you know, but he's just, I think he's just trying to find himself, you know, and as long as people, as long as you have yes men, sometimes when you find you you think you found yourself, you haven't. Cause everybody goes, Oh, this is great. And it's like, yeah. Cause they're making money off of you. Yeah. You know? And, um, but there's just, how, how is that applicable to what you do? Because you're, you're an artist with what you do. Do you oh, find I'm, like, I'm not, you all, find, but you find like you, I've, I've taken this shit way too far. I got weird with these pictures. Yeah. Like this got weird. <laughs> Nobody likes it anymore. So, so I got a lot of that. So going back to how I got to where I was is a lot of magazines told me no, because I was trying to light stuff and, and my early stuff really did suck. Cause it was too dark. You know, it was too moody, but there was an editor named Courtney Hollowell. Uh, he used to be the editor of street trucks and he wound up being the editor of world of rods. He was the editor of hot bike and he kept giving me work even though I sucked. And so with Brian McCormick also that worked for street trucks, they're like, you're so close. Don't give up. And those guys there, if it wasn't for them just going, Hey, you're almost there, you know? And I'm, and I still, I still wake up every day trying to learn something new. And I think that's another reason why you find out what you're supposed to do is because you still have the drive to learn it. And it's, and I grew up, I would never really look at a car magazine and what people were currently doing because I didn't want to get jaded and copy what they were doing. And so I'd look at fashion magazines, like what was hot and like Vogue, you know, which would always get you weird ideas because you're like standing in a grocery store reading Vogue. <laughs> and then like these moms are walking by like, this guy looking at like lingerie photos. And looking stuff. like you do. Yeah, it looking, may have been a little bit those, well, I didn't always have the beard. So were those magazines, were they right at that point in time or were they <clears> had they not? were they not as advanced in looking at the things that you were looking at? They, they weren't where I wanted to be. So there had been a point where magazines, the, the artwork in, in photography and magazines were there. And then we got into like when stuff kind of digital, a lot of stuff got kind of sterile and got kind of boring and was just kind of blah. But if you go back to some of the film stuff, like Randy Lorenzen is one of my heroes and he's one of the greatest automotive photographers of all time. And so is Wes Allison that does a lot of work for Hot Rod. Yeah. And like those two dudes there. And and a lot of it, I got to where I was is I would look at one of Randy's old studio photos. Like he was on the Coddington podcast talking about how they did the Cadzilla poster that was in Hot Rod. And the backdrop for that, like, so you see like chain link fence and all this stuff. Well, it's shot in a studio. So you used to be able to go to the Hollywood movie place and buy a backdrop from a movie. Well, that backdrop is the backdrop from Spaceballs where oh, they, they go awesome. into that's like, cool. it's the space from where they go into like that vacuum cleaner ladies, the Death Star. It's yeah. the backdrop from that. And, but then when they did, it was a longer exposure. So it was like 
flash, 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 and everything was all done in one shot. But, you know, the exposure, you just went across, like nobody can move and all this other stuff. So, like, to go in and see that, but then I would look at those photos with the technology I currently had and go, I can do this. So I try to deconstruct those studio shots to get the light on the cars and stuff the way they were and then try to do it on location. Where, where does that picture exist? Can we pull that up? Is that readily uh, available? Oh, it should be. It should just be Cadzilla hot rod poster. But man, talk about the good old days. They drove Cadzilla to, what was it, Louisville or one of the hot rod shows. Like they just drove it. They just hopped in and went. There's pictures of, I'm, I'm lucky to be friends with Brad Fanshaw too. And uh, he has pictures of him in Japan with Boyd and he's driving Shazoom in Japan. And it's like, freaking awesome is that that's what Sweet. you know but there was one like he talked about they found a piece of fence outside and leaned it up in the background and everything like that but like that, that might be it there see how on the right how it has all the stuff and everything i think that's it but it was a lot of that stuff they found out in the alleyway and then added <laughs> to the poster but well, you can buy it on ebay right now yeah nothing's actual pictures so i have a bucket list of cars i want to shoot before i die and then every time i tell people they're like are you dying i'm like no i just <laughs> i have a list i was gonna ask did you, ever get to, did you ever get to shoot the riv no, so it's sad because um, Gary Howard passed away, and then one of the greatest things ever was Gary Howard started following me on Facebook, and he would actually comment on my pictures and said, that's a dope picture and stuff like that. Of course, he didn't say dope. I just have this problem of saying dope and rad. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so that's the back, that is the poster. That's the backdrop from that where they go in the inner ear of the robot from Spaceballs, and when they're doing, like, you know, when you drive in to blow up the Death Star. <laughs> so that's the picture for it. Then the fence and stuff they found out in the, in the parking lot. But, like, everything in that p picture is there, you know? That's crazy. Yeah. Who's the dude in the middle? Is it the drummer? Is he? Yeah, yeah that's, that's Frank uh, Beard. No, I'm not, like, yeah, I'm not a big... Like that's Anthony. I'm not a big ZZ Top <laughs> buff. Are you not? No. But, yeah, just look at... I mean, Tim's gonna you got to think of, like, the early <laughs> 90s, late 80s, early 90s, when that car came out. I mean, it's just... You know, Larry Erickson designed that, you know? I mean, it's just the history of it. But so I haven't ever got the, the rivies on the top of my list and like everybody involved with that car goes, anytime you want to come get it, come get it and shoot it. But I just, I almost feel like I cry a little bit. <laughs> and I don't want to be that guy, you know? So, uh, but I'll, I'll eventually shoot that car. And then, uh, but I have this problem of like trying to put stuff off and then stuff goes away. What's the so, line? What's the fine line or what, how do you from, <clears throat> I guess, print media, which is sadly, going away but yeah. for shooting a full feature on a car from a magazine about cars you want to see the car and you want to see the details and you want to see all the stuff the true color of the car and you want to see that however from an artistic photo shoot you also want to make that cool and moody and dark and have lighting and stuff like that how do you how do you figure out well so you've probably seen it you know like if you look at like a new like the new Porsche photography is great but that color is not right like when you look at everything's oversaturated, over contrasted. So you have to run that fine line of the main reason I started lighting stuff is because I like metal flake. And the only way to get metal flake to pop is to throw a hard light at it. So if you want to show the flake, you got to do it. So, you know, my whole thing is, is like perfect's not always cool, but cool's always cool. So it's more important for me for it to be cool than for it to be perfect. And sometimes when you try to make it perfect, stuff isn't actually like it is, you know? And, um, so, like, sometimes when you make a red look like this bold, crazy red, well, the car doesn't really look like that, you know. But it also doesn't look like I threw too much light at it and it turned pink. So, it's there is a fine line from inf affecting my art onto someone else's art because building a car is art. I don't care what anybody says. And um, so, you have to stay true to the art. So, if you look at that car in that Cadzilla poster, that that's how that car looks. But everything else in that picture, game's on, game on. You know, so it's a lot of times I work more of having that moody backdrop. And a lot of times, other than the car being lit, I don't even touch the car in Photoshop or anything. And in fact, most people will be surprised I have very rarely any Photoshop <clears throat> in my cars at all. Because I'll shoot a car, like, well, even when we shot the giveaway truck, I had pictures the next morning. And we finished, what, two, three o'clock in the morning? You know, it's like, you know, it's there. there's a long ass photo shoot, six o'clock at night. To, yeah. Yeah. To yeah. Morning, huh? Well, I had to wait for it to get dark, the lights to come on the city and the train to come by just right. It's a cool ass photo shoot. Though. Yeah. Yeah. Worked out great. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm so glad it did. <clears throat> Actually, that truck needed a night shoot because of all the lights and everything on it. And uh, because it's you'll always have an opportunity to shoot it during the day, mm -hmm. but you don't always have. And that was a cool spot because you have a city off in the backdrop. Yeah. I mean, it kind of had a Miami Vice feel to it. 
Yeah. And uh, I was watching that the other day because, you know, starting to work on YouTube is I'm trying to interject, letting you people see the work I do and then also hear the car run because a lot of times, you know, interactive together, the car and together. So my YouTube channel is more about, oh, you get to see the cars run. And then we go to the good guy show. I try to make the whole video more about cars coming in and out and running and not about, oh, look, here's a car just sitting here with the hood up, you know, and and those actually videos pull way more than if I get on there and start talking and telling you cool stuff. And this is how I did that. It's like, well, nobody watches that. It's like, <laughs> no, just show us cool cars. <laughs> it's like, so, but I'm going to start doing a, a thing too, just so like shops, just even to take build pictures, like all you really need is your phone or a pocket camera and shop lights. And you can make, you can take your shop pictures from being just okay to like, Oh, cool. Badass. So like, yeah, badass. And it's all just simple. It's just light photography's light and it's just having better light and taking just a few minutes just to focus on what you want to do. So that'll be a line coming up on my YouTube channel too, is photographing cars for basic people, you know, cause I don't really need to teach someone to shoot up here because whenever you go to tutorials on how do you take pictures of the car? Well, it's up here and half people don't even know how to operate a camera. Right. So like you have to go at it from, you know, they always say the best camera you have is the one you have with you. So like your phone or whatever, but, and it's, and a lot of the new small digital cameras, just like your phone, whatever you see on the back of the screen, that's the picture it takes. So I'm going to work with that to show people, you know, like I can't be there every minute of the build, but I can be there when it's done or I can be there a couple of times during the year to shoot it. But every day, a lot of these builds change, you know, and someone handcrafts something and then there's stuff over it. If somebody so, wants to get into photography as a, as a hobby or, or doing it for the shop and all that, and they want to go out tomorrow and buy a camera, what's the first camera they should buy with the budget of, I don't know, what is a thousand dollars, 1500 bucks. So I'm going to say it has to be a Fuji because that's what I shoot. But, <laughs> but, um, really everything's good now. Cause we were having that conversation <clears throat> the other day cause we ride mountain bikes for fun. It's like, if you spend a decent amount of money, there's no bad mountain bikes, you know, it's, and, it, and really, even if you go buy a new car off the dealership lot, even a base model car is a but big car But you can spend now. just a little bit more and get a mountain bike with a motor. They're, they call those dirt bikes. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> actually less. Actually, like dirt, bikes are cheaper. Less. Yeah. dirt bikes are cheaper than mountain bikes. Yeah. You get like a 450 like yeah. Yamaha for seven and it, grand and a full suspension mountain bike for like and then if you, 18, 20 oh yeah. grand. So if you take seven grand, Ooh, it makes no, no sense. If you take okay. seven grand and go in the used market of dirt bikes too, oh, you yeah. get some good stuff for seven grand. <laughs> You all spend, right, sorry. You can sorry, spend no, sorry. seven thousand dollars on a bicycle. So, Dude, did you, you see my mountain bike like that was in PPG's easily booth at SEMA that year? Dirt Reynolds, the one Jeremy put sixty five <laughs> yeah, hours yeah. in yes. painting. So that bike had custom built hubs on it, had custom brakes, carbon fiber everything on it. That bike, without the paint on it, was a thirteen thousand dollar bike. There isn't a dirt bike, and you got to pedal it, <laughs> and you got to pedal it. Like an entry level specialized full suspension is like thirty five hundred four yeah. grand. Yeah, so thousand dollars is you're gonna have a long day riding a bike because yeah, it has two components going to, and it's a hardtail. You're going to Dick's Sporting Goods. Yeah, you're for going to Dick's for a thousand dollars. You but, guys know how fast a dirt bike goes? Yeah, that's fucking you know how fast, fast, little effort. You know how fast a mountain bike goes down a hill after you ring up a chairlift? <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah, how fast you five can, pounds of taco when you. Yeah, you know how fast you can stop to <laughs> when you hit a tree. <laughs> Instantly. Yeah. Sure. That's Sonny Bono. That's <laughs> Is it too early for Sonny Bono jokes? No. Yeah, that's good years. Yeah. So what camera does somebody go out and buy? So <clears throat> I like, it really, they're, the cameras are like buying a welder. It's like, what are you going to do with it? So if you just want to take pictures, you know, your cell phone, the cell phones are great, or you can buy a fixed lens camera like the Fuji X100V. And it's like, Super nice, and that's a thousand dollars for that. But it does everything; it has film simulation, so it can look like old Kodak film and stuff like that. What about tasteful selfies for like an adult subscription site? Just stay with your cell phone because <laughs> it has image stable and a GoPro. Because GoPro like, the gray the though, I need to get some. <laughs> <laughs> you to do that one, right. and does leaning back? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> GoPros are great for that because they're image stabilized too. So, sorry. So yeah. Fuji, you, you heard Fuji. from the pros. Fuji, yeah. gotta gotta use Fuji. Can you get something nice enough to to have presentable work for fifteen hundred bucks? Yes, definitely. You is can it, probably buy. You can go for you can go into a thousand dollars. See, the problem is, is like, say you guys want to have a shop camera. Well, you got to think of all the morons that are going to touch the shop camera. Nothing against your employees, but the guys like, ooh, I'd be in all this day. room. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but 
you know, you don't. He's talking about you. You can't touch the camera. So I, I like. I wouldn't dare. I like the um, the small cameras that you don't change the lenses on because when you have to change the lens, then you get dust in the sensor, and then the other ones like you can still fit those small small regular lens cameras in your pocket now, and they've got and, and they're still like twenty four twenty five megapixel. So like they're still good enough. Like say a magazine wants to run a build photo of one of your things, the quality's still good, and you can still blow it up big enough for the wall, you know. And um, but yeah, so you can easily get into that between eight and eight hundred and a thousand dollars. Is the camera more important or the setup and then the post editing? So cameras have gotten really smart. So they have priority modes like aperture priority. So like if you know you want to shoot, let the background go out of focus a little bit, you just put it on like f2 and let the camera make all the adjustments for you so all you have to do is worry about one thing and that's usually what i recommend for people and they also have some of them have p mode which i say is professional and the camera figures everything out for you but the new cameras are so good you can just put it in p mode and just but the the hard part with guys in shops is you know a lot of the guys who want to do this aren't technologically advanced you know yeah like this guy well bobby alloway say bobby alloway because every time I got to give Bobby pictures of the cars. I either have to get Toby or I go, I just mail them or I just show up with a hard drive (laughs) and just plug it into his computer and download the stuff. And it's like, but it's nothing against Bobby. It's just like, Bobby's got more important things to do than to take a picture or something. Yes. You know, same thing. (laughs) (laughs) That was the other thing is everybody's like important shit to do. Yeah. That's like, I've shot so much softball for Bobby. It's not even funny. I've shot more softball than I've shot cars for Bobby and I've shot every car he's ever built. So where I mean, you've obviously you're pretty uh, easygoing guy. You got a great demeanor and stuff. Uh, you we talked about you know you find in your way and something that it's amazing what you really really care about versus what you think you care about and how hard you'll work at it for that. However, in all these years, there had to have been a time that you were out on a shoot, you were doing something, whether it's whatever, you're taking pictures of something that you're not into, and and you're you're second guessing your life choices. What's the worst? What do you, is there a time that you remember? You're like, so that shit sucked. I have a time where it's, and it wasn't that I was shooting something. Cause I've, I like if someone builds something and it's built well and it's not my style, I like it. Cause like, I mean, I've seen donks that are actually pretty cool. Like so is yeah, Tim at sure. gaps building one now that I'm, I'm like right there with you, oh, buddy. I'm like, I'm fine. Well, you're from Alabama. So yeah, I mean, yeah. okay. <laughs> but no, but, but you're from like, Houston. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, I'm gonna have those big wires on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, but sure like it. other than like stupid lifted trucks with no front drive shafts and useless, like chassis hanging down from them. I like everything, you know? And, um, and a lot of it's culture, you know, like even the big swanger wire wheels in Houston, that's a culture. It's like, if you get in that, like there's some cool Houston rap, like Bun B and stuff and Paul wall. And you get in like, if you're in Houston and you're eating Papacitos and you Paul walls on the radio and you see a couple of those cars go by, you're like, I want to hang out with these guys, you know? And it's, but then you go to like, they have that show at the the Texan stadium. And then you roll in with a 64 Corvair van that's bagged and pull in the parking lot and then realize, Oh, I don't belong here. And then you turn around and leave. So I've got 13 inch wheels in this. Van. Yeah. I, well, I had 15s, but I kept them clean. <laughs> that's <laughs> oh, so, all that matters. So the, the worst, the, the one moment where I was like, I just wanted to throw everything was uh, I was working for rod and custom. And that's when Kevin Lee was it before rod 48 was the editor when Kevin Lee was the editor and I go to Columbus and I shoot four covers for rod and custom. And then I get back to Texas in my Corvair van and my hard drive fails. So Ooh. all those pictures are gone. And at the time it's, <laughs> it's not like now where like it's easy to recover that stuff. So I had to, I had to get a hold of a service and the service is like, Oh yeah, $2,800. We'll re- do those. So luckily everybody was in that Cincinnati to Dayton corridor. So I got in the Corvair van, went back to Ohio and reshot all, f- I think it was six features. Oh, shit. You can and reshoot I sh- them for less than $2,800. I could reshoot them for less than $2,800. So, and at the time, you know, it, like I have some magazines that pay me nothing. Some magazines that pay me $200. I got some magazines that pay me $1,000. But back in the day, like you can make a couple grand shooting a feature. So it was, it was kind of worth it to go shoot six features again, you know? So I went back and shot everything. And it kind of made me kind of a legend with those guys in that Ohio area because I cared enough to go back and do it instead of just like, I went, I went back right away and did it too. I didn't just go, 
Hey, because it means next year. I mean, we got. Well, that's their we moment. Rem- yeah, you got to remember. It's, it means just as much, if not it more. It means more to them. Yeah. And I was just honored to be able to shoot their cars. And one of the ones that was crazy about it too was um, I can't remember Moss's first name, but I shot his chocolate brown roadster that ran in Rod and Custom. Randy Moss. No, it wasn't Randy, Randy Moss. Randy football. I was going to ask you how your uh, brackets were going in the NCAA when I got here and be like, who cares? <laughs> strong to moderate. So that's strong. For basketball. Yeah. Hey, what do you get yeah. about? Yeah. <laughs> it's for the- I went back and did all those. I made, and I made better <clears throat> friends with all those guys. Like one of the guys, I shot two of the cars in Cincinnati together, and I shot a picture of him and his son together with the car. Well, his son just went to college. So, like, his son's this big, you know, in the pictures. And it's like, you can't ever recreate that, you know. Yeah. It's like that guy probably has that picture in his house somewhere. And, um, but the Moss guy, um, I shot his roadster and that's when I really became good friends with Gary Buckles and, um, another which, great name. Oh, another great. Well, you know, his Camaro, right? The blue Camaro with a wrench on the floor with the deuce boy deuces on it. It ran a hot rod magazine back in the nineties and it still looks exactly like it has hydraulics on it and everything. He's the, one of the main guys at Dayton wire wheel. Oh yeah. 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 So it's like Long a seven ponytail. Yeah. Like a yeah, pro street. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Like Long, a pro street. Yep. Yeah. 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 Like second gen Camaro. Yeah. yeah. So, but Gary buckles. Yeah. Gary's a great dude. And talk about Dayton wire wheel, something that's been around for a while. And, um, so flash forward to the first Loniker and Scott Sullivan's judging and, you know, Scott Sullivan's like legend, you know, and it's like, and Scott Sullivan's like, I always feel like he doesn't know who I am when I talk to him and he comes up to me and goes, you act like, I don't know who you are. And I'm like, and uh, he goes, you shot my best friend's car. And he holds that up. And a screensaver on his phone was that photo That's shoot. Cool. And that guy had passed cool. away. But him, they were really good friends. So his screensaver was his friend's car. And I happened to take that car, that picture of that car. And it was on Scott Sullivan's phone. Did you check to make sure you got photo credit? Yeah, I was like, yeah, I make sure. I was like, oh. Logo in the bottom. Yeah, yeah. Make sure. Well, that's the thing is like. That used to be a big deal is like everybody, their logo is real big on the camera. Well, if you look at my photos throughout the years, there've never really been a logo on the bottom of them because it takes away from the picture and it takes away from the car. So that's the whole reason why I did it. Cause people are going to steal your shit. They're going to steal your shit. You know, there's a ton of those pages now that you go, I go through there like every few days and I'm like built by photo by, and it's always, it's always some foreign page for hot rods. You know, and it's like, if I see one of your cars, I go built by roaster shop. I just nice. like, like when I stroll through and I see one of your cars and I pop it up, I'm just like built by, and I just always go through and do it. And, um, I've thrown built by or photographed by not stock on several pictures I've taken. Nice. Well, that's fine. <laughs> as long as it's one of us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, uh, but that's the thing is like, I've been blocked from so many pages by like, Hey, I took that picture. <clears throat> Could you at least give me some credit on it? You know? And it's like, and then all of a sudden I'm blocked and I'm just like, so now I just go in the comments and you'll see them delete it. And you put it back. like, who cares? Right. I mean, I know a lot of them probably try to make they, what those guys do is they build those pages and they sell them to some company because yeah. they have 40,000 followers now. And, um, so, but it's just one of those ones, but that was probably the worst moment in my life is when, uh, you know, uh, I lost all that, but then I went back and reshot everything and it actually wound up being better for my career that I went. Cause that's a great corridor of cars where you go from Cincinnati all the way up to like Piqua, which is just North of, of Dayton. Like there's so many good cars in that corridor right there. Hot rods. And like at the time Hilton had hot rods in there and Josh Shaw was from there and Gary Buckles was from there and Sullivan was from there. And then, um, Oh, that guy that built that Plymouth that was a custom rod finalist. That was, like it's an ugly car, but he built. I can't remember his name. I'm a, he bought me lunch the is other day. The one with the roll bar. Thing no, there? no, this is a different one. No, that's my worst problem. I know cars more. I hope I can remember people's yeah. names. That's like part of it's getting old. So, out of all comes those, for all of us. Yeah. Out of all those photo shoots, what's like the biggest disaster that's happened with a car? So I'm gonna give you the biggest disaster that's happened at a photo shoot, and uh, it's pretty morbid. But when I was <laughs> hanging out with Scott from Sick Chops shooting that red truck. A guy died at our photo shoot. So we're shooting that red truck and it's bike week in Cave Creek or Scottsdale. Yeah. And all of a sudden there's motorcycles. And we, I've got cameras going, drones going. I'm shooting this truck for good guys. And uh, these guys are just on it on their motorcycles coming out. And there's a slight curve and it goes to the state park or go, keeps on going. Well, the first guy rips through and all of a sudden the first guy high sides, catches a pedal, launches and goes head first right into a boulder. And Scott's first person on the scene because Scott used to be a first responder. Yeah. And so I'm calling 911 and um, 
and um, I go, hey, say so you want to know if you can uh, mouth to mouth. Scott's like, no, like instantly. So that that guy died instantly. And then you got to deal with like his buddy came back, Oof. and then you have to be a witness to the cops. And then I'm also trying to finish shooting the truck for good guys because I only had six pictures of it before it started. So I'm like, where do you draw the line of when you stop? Because there's, wow, you know, Man, I shouldn't have lifted this rod. I thought it was going to be something. <laughs> Yeah, like funny, like this no, thing. No, no, <laughs> this so, thing caught on so, fire. Or this, like, yeah. Um, this. Oh well, I'll tell you a good one on the catch on fire, and this goes back to me. Luckily, <laughs> I was, I had done a lot of these cheesy, crappy parts for um, on many trucks back in the day, but you know, door poppers that you used to buy them from AIM, mm-hmm. could, and, could, and and those door poppers have never changed in forty years. It's no. the same door poppers. I think they're just NOS stock they sell as new. <laughs> so crew cut that uh, gas monkey rebuilt. Well, my buddy Chad used to run the shop. It's the the green the green dealer with the flames. My buddy oh, Dave yeah. Shulman bought just in here a week yeah. ago. Yeah. Oh, was it? Yeah. Yeah. My buddy Dave Shulman owns that. That's yeah. Dave was yeah. here. Oh, was he? Yeah. yeah. Dave's a good dude. Like I used to be in that car club acrophobia with him back in the day, and me and Dave have been friends forever. So I shot that for the cover of trucking. So when we get done shooting it, we go for a ride in it and stuff, and um, all of a sudden it's like I smell smoke, and I was gonna see smoke rolling out of the door. And then Chad's all like, it's always Ooh. got a certain type of smell. Too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know what? Well, I used to install car stereos. Cause like, yep, you know, it's honestly, same being, smell. Yeah, so it's like, <laughs> I've burnt stuff before. I know the smell. And so I'm, uh, I'm, he's all like, Oh, what? And like, no one's there, but me and Chad, like none of the mechanics are there or anything like that. And he's basically just shop foreman. And I'm like, give me a pair of clippers. And I'm like, I hope they didn't like, I'm trying to get the door panel off. I'm like, I hope they use clips on this and it's not screwed in. Cause I'm pulling on the door panels. I pop the door panel off and see, and I just cut the wire to the door popper. And of course I was like, I was like, luckily it was pieces on. I didn't destroy the door panel, but I was like still better than burning the truck down. <laughs> so, but it, it was nothing to do with installation. It's just a shit part. You know, it's like, and that's usually what happens. A lot of people get, Oh, that guy built a shit car. It's like, well, no, you want to shave door handles. So it had to have a door popper. And they make the, the same door popper you bought in 1989. It's still the same door popper they sell in 2023, you know? We give him shit about not being able to operate, like, electronics or any technology. But he's developed a new skill of being able to oh, take yeah. perfectly good appliances and them a setting on fire, fire yeah. right in front of him. Nice. Dude, uh, yeah. That's a skill, though. <laughs> yeah, walk out of my, I, yeah, I walk out of my office for, like, five minutes randomly during the day. And I walk <laughs> back in, and I'm like, Man, it stinks. It smells like something's burning in here. And I look over, and the monitor, my monitor is just like smoking, like flames. Every like, how do you even do that on a monitor? He's, yeah. I'm sure he did something it, wrong. So I'm like, again, he did. It took me, I had to do like a times. double take. I'm sitting there and I'm looking at this thing and I'm like, what the fuck? Like, is this seriously happening? Monitor is just like blowing up. So I just grab the thing, yank the wires out of it. Hold it out in front of me, and it's this thing is smoking hot. <laughs> Fire, smoke, everything. Run it across the shop, toss it out in the yard. I mean, what? How does that you even get happen? To shoot it? No. <laughs> <laughs> and a week later, his fish tank caught on fire. Yeah. Yeah. How, does, how do you catch my a kids, fish tank before? My kid's fish tank caught. Yeah, it almost burnt the damn house down. Crazy. <laughs> yeah. He's I'm telling you, him in electronics. It's, I don't know. Yeah. It's, uh, well, now we come to the standard question part. Of the interview, so you're you're prepared though. I don't like this because you've Please. listened to it, so I'm gonna have to throw some curveballs. Oh, it's all fine. So be thinking about some curveballs as well. Yeah. Fa- uh, best piece of advice. So, my grandfather tell me I was fucking up was probably one of the best pieces of advice. That's a pretty good one. But another f bomb that was good advice was Dan Webb. Um, I'd worked for a bunch of magazines, and there was a a street rod magazine at the time that would have nothing to do with me, and I just I wanted everybody to like me back then. I was like, I just want everybody to be my friend. I want everybody to run my work. I just love cars. Just run my pictures. But they want nothing to do with my style. What and Dan went, was? Uh, it started with Street Rod, but or I don't know what it was. So, <laughs> which I work for Brian now. So, or at least I did up until this podcast. <laughs> so, but but that was a different time, you know. And it's like in my, I had a lot of my photo was more art than usable because like what I do for art versus what I do for magazine slash arts totally different sure. so i there's a fine line you know because you can't go like a lot of stuff doesn't equal out into print you know if you get a two-page spread like that cadzilla deal it'll make sense but if you're trying to put it real small in one piece it's like it's like hey i want the battle of the alamo on my arm on a tattoo it's like it just doesn't fit so but it took some learning on my side on that too but i was telling 
I'd just become friends with Dan Webb at Detroit for that. And of course I did Corey and Ashley's wedding. Cause you asked if I do weddings and stuff like that. So I do do weddings for friends. And, uh, I told Dan this and Dan goes, Hey, you know what? I was like, I was like, oh, I really want to do this and all this other stuff. And he goes, you know what? Fuck them. <laughs> he's like, if they don't like you for who you are, fuck them. And he's like, find somebody else. He's like, even if you just work for the builders and you just do stuff for them, he goes, you're doing what you love. And he's like, you're not selling yourself out. You're doing exactly what you want to do. And, uh, and then, you know, I kind of developed a style where I could do both sides where I'm happy, you know, with being able to do magazine. I mean, the, like Rodgers Journal and big, nice format magazines let me do whatever I want and don't even question it. But like when you're trying to print on that old print paper, you know, like stuff that was dark didn't translate well, you know. So it wasn't really that they didn't like me as a person. It's just it didn't work for the print style at the time. So but now print paper is way better, like even on the the regular newsstand magazines like at one time like rod and custom you could almost look through the paper it had got so thin so if stuff's a lot of dark images on that that doesn't print well onto that paper so but it had nothing to do with me but yeah so dan webb telling me like not to worry about it. and then also also alloway had a good one too when he won ambr i used to enter photo contests all the time in fact i finished second in the mccallan photo contest before i even started drinking whiskey really? twice I, you know with car pictures when everything else is landscape huh. and pictures of sheep and all this other stuff because it's mccallan and um sheep sheep but i i'd always complain i'd always complain that like i wouldn't get a fair share because i was i was submitting car pictures to landscape photo <laughs> photo contests so it's like but but Alloway gave me that whole point on like you know stuff's built for a certain thing and if it does that certain thing the other stuff shouldn't matter so when I take the pictures and the builders love the photos I took and that's how to them in their mind, that's how the car should look, then I've won. So when it goes to a contest, almost like a car show, if like some dude doesn't like it, yep. well, that doesn't make it, it's bad. So Alloway did that with that AMBR car. He took it, he won AMBR with it, Larry's Roadster, mm-hmm. went to Columbus and I was like, hey, why do you know that for Street Ride of the Year? He goes, well, it was built to win AMBR. And if it, comes here and I enter for street ride of the year and it doesn't win. Well, then people second guess it. It's already won what it was built to win. So it doesn't really need to enter anything else. It was built to be an AMBR car. Yep. It won AMBR. And you know how it is. Sometimes you go to show, it's like, well, it's already won this. We're going to let this other one win. And it comes down to that stuff. You know, you're not saying there's politics. No, in not at all. Shows, is there? Nope. Not at all. <laughs> wow. It's the first I've heard. Next, next, next change subject. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> change the next subject. I do, I do work for good guys. So we, all, we, yeah, we all do. I don't even think of- I'm allowed to play the game anymore where we all take dollar bills and pick our top five for Street Machine and throw it in the hat like we used to. Because I think technically being a good guy's employee, I'm not allowed mm. to do that anymore. <laughs> it's like insider trading. Yeah, probably. We were pretty good at it, though. Yeah, well, except for one year. Yeah. Oh, we talked about that earlier with Slice, but that was... That was the first year I didn't have them. That's that's probably the only year I didn't. I don't have think the anybody won. No, no, year. no. I don't think anybody got that money, did they? No. no. What What was crazy was Andy's and Pal I threw out there as a joke, and I was like, "It's more of a street rod, but I'm going to put it in there just because I think they'll want to throw a thing on it." And it was the only car I had in the five out of all of them. And then when you came to me and go, "That Mustang we brought is the worst car we got. How'd that yeah. make it?" And uh, speaking of good cars, that Detroit Speed Charger. Yeah. Man, that was a great car. I haven't seen that car since Florida right after that. And I, I haven't seen it had something since. against Mopar that year. They must have. Where did that go? I don't know. That's a great car. It was a, it was like a, I always remember it was Moe's Charger. Yeah. Right? Yep. I, think I miss Kyle Tucker too. I think Tyrone Malone. Yeah, Tyrone Malone's guy. I miss seeing Kyle it. Tucker at shows too. Yeah. 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 Good old Kyle. That was, I mean, man, what a, Touch a class, yeah. Every show, yeah. That was that was that was a great podcast too, because I didn't realize the whole go kart racing and stuff like that. And it's, that's another one. I was always like, man, that guy's life was way cooler than mine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he had a cool one. <laughs> Favorite SEMA story. So, I had one happen this year that we call my wife story. So I'll tell two. So, my wife says I have this thing called road <clears throat> luck, and I'm going to tell you a road luck story. So the year that we painted. The, the Corvair Van Silver, I took it to a hot rod show in Maryland, then drove from Maryland all the way to Vegas for SEMA. And it's I get, so yeah. yeah, so all 102 horsepower of it. Again, drove it 170,000 miles in four years, like a moron. And um, I get to Alloway shop, fuel pumps leaking because it still has a mechanical fuel pump, still has points, all that stuff in it because it's easy to fix. So Bobby goes, I think your, your Corvair's leaking, leaking fuel. And I had notes that had a couple drops behind it. So we went... And, um, 
Little diaphragm. We, yeah, the diaphragm one. So uh, Toby calls O'Reilly's. O'Reilly's has one. They bring it over, and I fix it because it just – new one back in. And then I hit the road. And then I know you guys have made the SEMA trip. So once you get outside of Amarillo and you cross the Welcome to New Mexico sign, how there's nothing. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm sunset 20 miles past that rest area. And all of a sudden, the Corvair slings a belt, which Corvairs are known for that. And um, I, uh, I go out, put the belt back on, start it back up, slings the belt. I'm like, what the hell? Well, it stripped the bolt out of the tensioner. And normally I would carry everything and clean where I could chase the threads, put all that other stuff. Didn't have it. So just as I leaned my head on the top of the van going, oh, I'm fucked. And uh, this Dodge Dually pulls up behind me with a trailer. With, and a, I'm, with a group of Hawaiian traffic. <laughs> two models. Uh, here's a right on about yeah. <laughs> 10 miles. Yeah, going, no, no, bro, about 10 miles. <laughs> but so I'm like, last thing I want to do. I, oh, the guy goes, oh, I thought that was a Corvair van. I'm like, oh, this is the last thing I want to do. This there guy. Corvair is enthusiast. Yeah. Plenty of mine had one. Yeah. So come to find out the guy started the chapter of the Corvair <clears throat> Club of America in New wow. England. He was driving to California with an open trailer and he goes, well, let's just throw it up on the trailer. And I know a guy in Albuquerque who works on Corvairs and I'll call ahead and see if he'll stay open. And, uh, so we load the Corvair van on the trailer. I tried to put fuel in the truck for him. Wouldn't take any money for it. Cause I got someone paying me for this. They're already paying for this. He goes, don't worry about it. So we get to Albuquerque. It's behind some guy's house. You walk in and like Corvair guys are crazy because they'll have all the parts for every Corvair just cause they just buy it. You know, because once Cor- you know, you can't buy no new Corvair parts. So the guy goes, I can, I've got one of these. I'll fix it. He goes, drop it off here. Come back at six in the morning. I'll have you ready to go. And I talked to that guy. I was like, well, let me get you a hotel room at least. And I was like, cause it's already like one o'clock in the morning and then you can start back off in the morning. So 6am, my alarm goes up. I go up down to get breakfast, walk out. He's already gone. Truck and trailer's gone. Walk down to the guy's shop and he goes, um, he goes, Oh, here you go. And then Corvair vans are notorious for uh, throwing bearings in the rear and they don't have keeps on them. So they start squeaking anytime the axle can come out. And uh, he goes, I know it's hard to find these bearings. He goes, so I have a complete axle here. I just want to give it to you. And then you owe me 50 bucks for the other one. And then I get back in the van, drive to SEMA, get to the airport. And I'm only 20 minutes late to pick my wife up from flying into, into SEMA Damn, wow. after all that happened. But it was like, it was 2,300 miles or something like that. But that was just typical. And then also, um, I always get asked a question on the beard. So Courtney Hollowell, that was the editor, uh, he's passed away. That first year I go to SEMA with the van before we bagged it, it was still blue and everything. I show up and I drove it 1,800 miles or something like that to SEMA and I cleaned it up and I shaved, got a haircut. But he goes, oh, you're such a sellout. He goes, these people should just like you for who you are. You shouldn't be cleaning, not being you just for these people because you're going to have meetings while you're here. And I was like, I'll tell you what, next SEMA, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to shave next SEMA. And I won't wash any bugs off of this. Well, he passed away before the next SEMA, and I haven't shaved since. So that's why I have this beard. <laughs> and they, everybody called him Tito. So that's on my trigger fingers, Tito for Courtney Hollowell. Damn. But if it wasn't for that dude running my pictures, even when it sucked and like hot bike and all this other stuff, I probably wouldn't be here taking pictures and hanging that's out cool. with you guys today. So it's a great story. But yeah. So, oh, so now we got to go to the real SEMA story. So this <laughs> yeah. happened this year. This one's I'm, a banger. Yeah. I, yeah. Literally. <laughs> I told you this one. And, um, I didn't think I'd actually ever be on this show because, but obviously you're running out of guests, so I can make it. And we're, um, we're looking for somebody to overtake the number one spot. Yeah, I've well, seen the stories where Josh the, has been no the sitting rings in for some time. I think the rings yeah. have got that one. It's rings are hard to top. I've got one I can tell off the air that my wife has progressed. And said I, there's no way I can tell the story. Josh told his off the no, air no, one on is, on the air. This 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 <laughs> this one's bad. I'm not allowed. In fact, she's probably going. You shouldn't even went this far. <laughs> But oh, so, so let me tell you this, this is, I'm working for BSF this year at SEMA and, uh, Tina goes, Hey, can you come to the party at, um, top golf and take behind the scene pictures for us? And I'm like, all right, cool. So we go there and, you know, Richard Petty's there and chips there and Jonathan Gorgie's there and all the reps are there hitting golf balls and stuff. So I'm just like being paparazzi for all that. And then it gets late and, um, Tina goes, Oh, you guys can go ahead and go and stuff like that. I'm like, all right. So JC goes, do you want to lift now? Or do you want to lift in 10 minutes? And I was like, ah, 10 minutes is fine. We'll just still say hi to people and stuff. So I didn't realize in 10 minutes, everybody from, cause top golf runs on out, like you have an hour or whatever. Everybody in top golf goes outside in this 10 minutes. So we're in line for a lift. All of a sudden this black sprinter van pulls in 
And uh, this guy gets out, and he kind of walks a little crooked, and he's parked crooked in the drive. And um, the guy at the door goes, hey, can't park there. And he's like, oh, fuck off. I'll be gone in a minute. And he goes inside. Well, he comes back outside, and I'm walking down in between the curb and cars. It's Tiger Woods, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm walking in between the curb and cars, and the dude starts walking toward me. And I'm all like, so just when he gets to me, I do the lean in, you know, because you don't let some dude just hit you. And so I lean in, bounce him. I say, who, oh, what the fuck's your problem? I'm like, going to my lift, fuck off. And I just keep walking because I'm like, my wife's with me. I can't just punch this dude in the face, you know? And, um, and so we go and get in the lift and our lift driver's like, so what was that guy's problem? I was like, he's on something. Cause you could, you smell that chemical smell. It's not liquor. He's on, he's popping something. And, um, so we get in the lift and our, our driver's super nice. He's Hawaiian. He just got out of the Navy or whatever, Air Force or something like that. So we start driving. We're in this minivan. It's, I'm here. My wife's here. He's in the front. We get up to the van. He goes, hey, uh, can you move your van out of the road here? We just want to want to get out. And he goes, you can fucking wait your turn like everybody else. That guy goes like that. He goes like, we, our driver goes, we ain't got to be a fucking asshole. So they start going back and forth a little bit. And all of a sudden, he reaches in and flips the driver's hat. I and, remember this. And all of a sudden... <laughs> Yeah. Our driver pulls his hand cannon out of the center <laughs> yeah. console. And we're not talking like 25. We're talking like 45 with like a brake on the end of it. And it's Cerakoted like three different colors and like right in the dude's face. And this dude, I mean, I'll give this dude props. He, I wouldn't play poker with him because he, he goes to his back like this. So I'm all of a sudden I grab my wife and then I realize that dude ain't got, you, you can see his back. That dude ain't got shit. He's on top of his shirt. Like he doesn't have nothing in his pocket. And I'm like, that's a hell of a bluff when the dude's got a gun in your face. And so he's talking smack to him and then he tries to open the door and he goes, you're lucky you're in that car. Our driver unbuckles his seatbelt, gets out with his gun. He goes, I'm out now. Now what? <laughs> and I'm all like, I'm like that meme of Michael Jackson eating popcorn. And then my wife's like, like a dog. Like, do we call the cops? What do we do? I'm like, let's just see what happens. But I remember when he first pulled that gun out, I had my fingers in my ear. I was like, Ooh, this is going to be loud. <laughs> and um, So that dude was like, fuck you. I'm calling the cops. Like he goes, he gets in his van and then like 10 dudes get in the van with him from that other floor and nobody from BSF, but it was from the other floor, get in the van and then he starts to drive off. Well, then he calls the cops and the, the cops like, what well, can you see his license plate? So he starts following the van. And I was told my wife, I was like, this is when we get out. I was like, if we get to a stop, we're just getting out. <laughs> and, um, so, but l luckily he just went into the driveway, got the license plate number, but Vegas police were like, well, if you want to come in Monday and fill a report, <laughs> like they didn't give a fuck, you know? And then, uh, so then, uh, so my wife's like, so a uh, five-star review. I was like, definitely a five-star yeah. review. <laughs> that's, that's, a then, that's a 25%, yeah, 25 but normally I don't send these and Uber then, drivers. And then, and then uh, and she's like, I feel like we should give him a review. And I was like, our driver was really good, especially when he had to pull the gun on this guy. And I was like, don't put that in there because I'll get the dude fired. So the dude was from Hawaii. I felt really bad because he goes... <clears throat> He goes, I don't even know why I'm in Vegas. He's like, I just thought it'd be a cool thing. I just got out of the Navy or whatever. I'm from Hawaii. He's like, I'm a, he's like, I'm a pacifist. And I'm like, yeah. that pistol, you're a pacifist. <laughs> yeah. And he's talking about how he just likes to shoot guns and stuff like that. And I'm like, I totally get it. And, uh, but that's my wife's because my, and literally the day before that, my wife goes, man, you guys have such good SEMA stories. And I don't have one. So I looked at her and go, well, you got a SEMA yeah, story. Got one <laughs> <laughs> like, you got a banger too. You know, it's like, so that's a good one. That's I, a, that I, is I, a good one. I yeah, remember so, you telling us about that yeah, when you were out in yeah, Vegas. I, if that's one of those ones that like I never expected to be on the podcast, or I wouldn't have told you that because it's like one of those ones. Like if I if you'd have never heard it, you'd have been like, but that's that dude pulled nuts. out a legit handgun. It's like come out of the center console. I was like, it wasn't like a like he was, hey buddy, get out of the way. It's like <laughs> that's oh, right. fucking red dot sights on it and everything Damn. too. And I'm just like power move to say I'm out of the car now. I will say, I give the other dude credit, like you said, poker face, when dude. Put that that dude straight to the back, like he's grabbing a pistol with nothing. Like he faked having a knife when he first came up, huh. and it's just like, but that guy knows the Vegas game, you know. I mean, it's like you know, fake it till you make it, I guess. But that's a pretty good one. But um, but I do miss old SEMA, by the way. Like every year you go and whatever the new car was, there'd be one of those on airbags and all this other stuff, and it's like now it's kind of like. Ugh. Yeah. So but yeah, they don't have that new. I still like go see people and get great food, but man, those old days of SEMA. I mean, like my buddy Mitch Henderson who passed away. Like, like a lot of where I got today is like Mitch Henderson and his guys. They bagged my Corvair van in one day in Texas. We test drove it six miles, then drove it from Rockwell, Texas, all the way to Nashville. Good guys, and put it in the Bedwoods booth, and then we slept in the Bedwoods trailer that day. Damn. And that's like all the way there, like. 
like, so we drove it. We knew we had a, like a slight leak in the rear. So like the right rear bag would leak bump down. A little bit. So we had to bump it up every 30 minutes <laughs> and the Corvair van would only run 65 miles an hour. And of course, Mitch had that truck sexual chocolate at the time. And that was in a trailer behind his bag, red dually. And those dudes were running a hundred and I'm riding 60 and they'd be like, Hey, we're text- taking this exit for fuel. And by the time I get the exit and get off to get fuel, they were already like, all right, we're going, we'll tell you where we're stopping the next <laughs> one. And it's me by myself. And luckily, you know, I had really good stereo and all this other stuff in it. So I had a good time, but man, by the time we got there, but like, man, I miss those good old days. And, uh, but yeah, those, uh, man, just all the friendships we've made just doing stupid car stuff. It's like, it's dumb the, stuff. The dumb stuff. I, I'm, I'm, and I'm kind of, part of me wishes we had video cameras back then, but a lot of me wishes I'm just glad we did. Hey, yeah. might not like be. kids have it. Right. That's what's rough for kids today. Like everything now, <clears throat> like you're going to jail. You know, for what, like, like there was a guy on YouTube the other day because of, he filmed some people like, like one of those deals where people take over the street and do burnouts. Like he got arrested for filming it. Really? Like that he was part of it on YouTube. And I was like, we would have for sure been arrested. Oh yeah, definitely. Same Mike and Jim would still be in prison. Yeah. Yeah. Under the prison. (laughs) Oh, can I bring back a segment? Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Truck stop fines. Dude, we haven't been on the road. I was, I was in Bloomington, uh, Drove down to Bloomington, Illinois yesterday, and there was a awesome little rotary uh, knife display yep. at a truck stop, and I was tempted. Really? But we didn't have the segment. I'm like, I don't know. I was just like, are we still doing this? We we're, we just haven't done it because we haven't found anything great. So, Did you bring something? I was in Oklahoma. Can I just start it with that? <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh dude. I've got, sequins, one in my, I've got one in my or, drawer that I was gifted. I got to go get well, it. Well, I'm leaving this with you guys. Oh, if you want to get another one, we can have two. <laughs> I got to go get it. So who wants to go first? Truck stop treasures. Oh, it's like it's a draw. Yep. Whip it out. Yeah, it's been a minute. Right. I think John I think, goes first. I think Jeremy should go first. All right, Jeremy goes first. Okay. So get a look at this. Tiger USA. Everybody's obviously familiar with Tiger oh, yeah, USA. Yeah, Tiger if USA. <laughs> if you're a cutlery enthusiast. If you put USA in the name, yeah. chances are it's probably not made in Look the USA. It is. <laughs> yeah. well, it's, yeah. and it, there used to be like a place in China called USA well, China. Look at that. Here, lay those side by side because you've got Tiger USA and made, made in China. China. <laughs> made in <Nice>. China. <laughs> Can't quite see that, can you? But nice. Yeah, just it's all about the maybe it's just right. the black bags. Made Get in China. a look at you. that banger right there. That says "We the People" on it. See oh. that? Right there, wow. <laughs> and Trump, Donald Trump. Yeah, the action's actually really good. Let me see that thing. That looks like a legit knife, yeah. actually. A We the People Trump knife made I, in, China in China from Tiger Ooh. USA. Yeah, you know how I, funny it would be. Remember how, like, when you go to like a flea market, there's all the Eisenhower pens and all that stuff. Is like in a hundred years, is this all this Trump stuff going to be like? Oh, look what I found at the flea market. This is worth like two hundred dollars. Yeah. <laughs> you bought it for like eleven bucks. I'd love to meet the guy who's like legitimately carrying that. Oh, I have yeah. a feeling you've probably yeah. met that guy. Yeah. He, he's probably from Florida. <laughs> he probably is <laughs> North Alabama, Northern Florida. Oh, I, actually, you know, driving the back road between Muhammad at Troy's to here, uh, I feel like I might have passed that guy. Probably. I'd rather meet the guy that had that was in the new product idea that came in. He's like, I'll give that sucker the paper test. I've got it. The finger test. Sure. I think that's user error, honestly. You so. got it's a slice, not a not a cut. Get it. Let's see if it if I get it. Um, oh, user error. Still not sharp enough though, you can tell. Damn. <laughs> it will well, some kill. knives are for dressed occasions and some are for work. I think that's more of like, hey, I'm going out in the town. I need my Yeah, there there might be a riot. I might need a knife. Also, probably good. Honey, we're going to Cracker Barrel tonight. <laughs> it's really good at Thanksgiving so dinner. Cracker Barrel is a good segue to mine. Okay. So, <laughs> mm. so I am the, at the hash Dave's Hot Rods, room. just north of Tulsa, and they take me to the Silver Dollar Diner. I know technically not a truck stop, but uh, you go in and there's pool tables. Anytime there's a pool table in a restaurant, you know, and food was excellent. And our waitress looked like Elvis's mom with a black curly mullet and diamond glasses. And over on the side, they had these glass cases with just knives and stuff in a restaurant. And so I start browsing through there. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Was the artwork on the walls for sale? We have a brass knuckle slingshot. Oh, shit. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm donating this to your museum. Wow. That could be so, the coolest thing I've ever seen. Yeah, so. That, that is awesome. 
Yeah, so hanging out with the guys at Davis Hot Rods, I had to buy it. And he goes, I have these in other colors. And I was like, no, I think gold is <laughs> gold legit. Is worth and, and the old guy who owns the place. How is nobody thought of that And before? why not? That is the most ergonomic so, slingshot. So you know my wife, when I told my wife what I bought for this, she goes, how does that even work? How do you slingshot brass knuckles into someone's face? So she was thinking a slingshot, a slingshot with, with brass knuckles. Brass knuckles. Damn. That's a dual purpose weapon because yeah. once so, you run out, then you're. Yeah. <laughs> so the guy, the guy, the old guy behind the counter, as I'm, I was like, how much is that? And he's like 15 bucks. And I'm like, I got to have it. And uh, he goes, uh, those things are pretty accurate too. He's like, <laughs> I was like, he goes, I was like, really? It's like, how many times have you shot this? He goes, oh, I shoot them every once in a while. And it's like, well, yeah. So are there slingshots that like are more accurate than others? I have no idea. Well, I mean, if anyone's going to be accurate, it's going to be a brass knuckle one, right? Yep. I feel like somebody in that um, Leonardo <laughs> DiCaprio movie, Kings of New York or whatever, yes. like where they're all stabbing each other with machetes. I think someone had that in that movie. I'm waiting for oh, that to pop yeah. loose. And that is, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, yeah, Jeremy. That he it, just shed all yeah, over your knife. He he did. Did. Aren't you glad you didn't go second though? <laughs> uh, yeah, like, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't have pulled like, it out. Nah, nah, uh, yeah, I would not have pulled it out. How has nobody else thought of that before? Like that's just like, genius. Hey, great. Oklahoma. Hmm. We the people. <laughs> Damn. But I want to. That's that's a gift to you guys. Is there, it's going to look awesome hey, in this. Yeah. Is there a patent? Uh, you might on daily anywhere? carry that. Any, yeah. sort of, any sort of patent? <laughs> EDC. <laughs> yeah. oh, you're, you're, you're is there a holster? Off, huh? Yeah. Thinking about it. Well, supposedly Wait, if we can reach out. So. All right, we take this technology, this design, and we reach out to Tiger USA. Oh, oh the We the People Donald Trump mm-hmm. brass knuckle slingshot. And you got something. God, I love that. <laughs> It's a great hand feel. Yeah. The let's go, Brandon. Yeah. As soon as I saw that, I was like. <laughs> Brass knuckle slingshot. Yeah, as soon as I saw yeah. that, I was yeah. like, I wonder if they'll bring back truck stop fines just for me. Because <laughs> Tru- oh, I one spent of the best so much time in truck stops in my life, you know? It's And the thing is, like, we we had a few things. And then, like, <clears> after we did that, a couple segments, we started being on the lookout. We're like, we got to find something. Yeah. Well, then, like, when you're trying to, oh, you, don't you find can't it. find yeah. anything. Yeah. The yep. season was just off. It was. Like, yeah. And every it. truck stops like turn into a flying J or a love. It's hard to get anything cool. Yeah, yeah. you got to get a lot of like Kenny Davis apparel there. Well, other than supposedly there's Heavily a bar in the flying J. In oh, yeah, City. there is. <laughs> oh. Have you never been to the J? No, bar? I, you know how many times I've been to Tyler's? He takes me to fancy places. Oh, I don't sh- know what kind of photography <laughs> things I am. You need to go to the J bar. You haven't lived until you've been to the J bar. I'm, I'm going to put that on the list. So, how, how many truck stops have you been to that have had a bar? Well, you know, it used to be more common back in the day. Like all those early ones from the seventies and eighties, like you would go in yeah. and there'd be beer and there'd be, you could get a shot and it's like, oh, so you're giving this guy driving a 30 ton rig down the highway. <laughs> Let's have a shot of whiskey. That's well, like that. You got to keep his hand steady. Yeah. What's that video that always pops up on Instagram? Everybody shares the, it's from the seventies dude driving a pickup talking about, oh, how he likes to have it's a almost few, communism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, like, I like to have a few beers after work. Well, that one that lady, she's sitting there and there's a kid next yeah. to her and she's like, so I just want a couple beers. It's almost communist country now. <laughs> That's probably Josh in the past your seat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look at him now. Uh, look at me now. Oh, I had to go in for <laughs> words of advice, too, and I totally blew it. I oh, fire gonna, away. Fire I was going to go. I was like, it was hard to believe that when I got here and I went in Josh's office, my the, what I was given as advice was on the wall. It just said, live, laugh, love. <laughs> and I was going to start with that, and I totally I totally blew it. Oh, and man. That I was, was as close as I was yeah. going to get with a Florida Georgia on, on that pe- On that piece of driftwood. It, yeah, on the piece <laughs> of driftwood. <laughs> My wife decorated. Oh, oh! My Sorry. wife is so funny. We've been building that house in <clears throat> Texas, and everything you go into now shiplap. And she's like, "Oh, I just want to strangle some people with shiplap." It's like it's so bad. It's like you see all these white shiplapped houses and stuff, and it's like, "Ugh, modern farmhouse." Yeah, man. it's so bad. It's gonna be awesome in like ten to fifteen years. Uh, it probably won't last yeah. that long. It'll probably no, when you're going to buy houses. Oh yeah, like it, the '90s Northbrook house it's, now. It's gonna oh, be yeah. like for Micah. Yeah. When well, everything, Micah everything, everything where they shapes. bought it and flipped it to shiplap. Now someone's gonna buy it and flip it back to the way it was in the '70s. Probably it's like, oh yeah, she had carpets back. Yeah. I'm Mid- waiting mid-century. for wood paneling to come back, like the vertical, like just the like in the basement. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Dude, everybody, we all have a story of that room. It was my uncle Jeans. We'd go to Delta, Missouri, every su- every other Sunday because my great grandmother lived there, and uh, we would go in the basement. It was all paneling, and the kids would all play pool. Or we play darts or something like that in the basement while the adults talked upstairs. That's does, like, does the paneling come with the pre like soaked in smoke odor? Oh yeah, or pretty much. That, yeah, you have you to get some cool basement stories and stuff too. Me? Yeah, and then the basement friends and stuff. Which? Oh, what are you referring to? There's just been some stories you've told. Oh, about. 
Yeah, I get it. I, I have a good one. A lot, a, lot of, a lot of good stuff. I have a basement. good kid story. When I was a kid, if you look, I have a scar right here. Yeah, you do. So uh, when I was going to church, I was probably four or five years old. I'm running in church, and um, I'm just being a kid, you know, and all of a sudden this little old lady goes, you need to stop running church or God's going to strike you down. It was like <laughs> two seconds later, I tripped and hit a pew. And just split my head open. I got like 20-some stitches when I was like Damn. four or five years old. Hmm. Thanks, yeah. bitch. Yeah, thanks, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> oh. If you could go back in time any time, what time would it be and what would you tell yourself? Um, that's a tough one because, like, you always want to go back and change stuff, but a lot of stuff made you grow and get you to where you're at. And um, I probably would have spent more time with my grandfather because, like, he tried really hard. And... Um, I've recently started, my wife always calls me the worst son ever because my mom talks to her, talk to her parents every other day. And I just been this guy, I'm out on the road. I'm just to myself a lot, you know, and, um, I'm, I'm okay with texting, but I'm not good talking to people on the phone. Like I just, I don't like that non-personal, you know, I'd rather see you in person, you know? And, um, but I, she showed me this podcast the other day where it goes, if you only see your mom at Christmas, and she's 70, you may only get to see her 10 more times the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. And it's like, so starting this year, my mom got me into photography at an early age, gave me those stupid little wind up 110 film cameras. And then I'm sure there's a billion of those somewhere that never developed because she would just, <laughs> she'd never develop them. But um, so I'm trying to get her back into taking pictures. And so her favorite photographer is actually this guy from, um, from Florida that shoots in the swamps. So for Christmas, I took her down to a showing of his work. And then we were probably going to do one of his workshops. And then she lives just south of Charlotte. So I've been trying to find uh, photography workshops and just take her to go see, let people talk about what they do. And I mean, I don't really want to take her to wedding stuff, but like landscape guys and architecture guys and, you know, take some photo stuff. And I just trying to spend more time with my mom, you know, it's like, it's, I still have time left that I can do that. So a lot of it would be, I would just spend more time with family that I just fucked off and hung out on the road. And then eventually it'll be that way with my wife too. Cause it's one of those ones that, you know, if, if you ever see that I'm getting divorced, <clears throat> it's totally my fault. It wasn't my wife at all. It's because I never came home. And, uh, but right now it's still cool with her because she's like, Oh, you're in Scottsdale. I'm flying in. And we talked about that earlier, but if I'm going someplace cool, she's more and more than welcome. But she just, she's just not for driving a thousand miles a day. Like I do. And she's just like, no, I, I'm not for this life. That's you. So that's not for everyone. No. Nope. Ah, John, it's been great. Oh, we got one more. The one everybody's waiting on. Movie or pocket dump? Oh, we, oh, we, got, we got two we more. We got two more. Two. Yeah. You're getting ahead of yourself. I'm sorry, I apologize. I'm getting, you're, getting getting out, listen, you're getting out in he front of your even, skis here. here yeah. He doesn't even have one of these. Yeah. What's, in your, what's in your pocket? All right. So this leads into me having another gift for you guys, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a Karis Customs oh, that custom pen. That one's fucking rad. Yeah. Damn. And then also, <clears throat> this is a MKM Italian knife. Like oh, the that texture thing is hand. really sweet. It's difficult. Yeah, check that out up. earlier. And then a. Uh, this is the Fuji X100V. I tried not to pull it out <laughs> when I was, but it actually had that uh, one in the pocket. In the pocket. Let me see the knife. I don't care about the camera. Yeah. We've got quite the, the, uh, the pen is sick. How many pockets do you have over well, there? Well, these are those 5'11 tactical pants. They're so great. Like, cause I like pants and they're comfortable and you can wear them in the summer. So, uh, I don't think I've ever seen you wear pants. You're wearing shorts. Oh, usually I'm wearing mountain bike shorts, but that's the thing is like, I like wearing boots and I like wearing pants. So it's just finding a good pair of pants that you can wear when it's 70 degrees outside. Cause usually me about 68, 70 degrees, I can't wear pants anymore. So is this like, this is like a legit camera. That's a legit like camera. Yeah. Good? That's the one I was telling you guys, uh, fixed lens camera. That's the X 100 V it's actually kind of hard to get, um, especially in the silver, but it looks like an old school camera, yeah, it's but cool. it's, it's a legit digital camera. And then, um, so I have two decades of Kyle Hicks. So Kyle made that for me like 13 years ago. It's my business card holder and I used it for a wallet because when you guys started talking about front wallets, that's like all my cards and stuff where I buy business cards at now. And this is one of Kyle's new Stingray wallets. 
Damn. That's pretty yeah. legit. Yeah. Me, yeah. Me we got off the wallet thing. We got to get back on that. Um, yeah. I still haven't found one, by the way. Me and, and Kyle Hicks have had a difficult time connecting. Yeah. Kyle said I, that he's talked to you. Yeah. And we, he's like, then you haven't talked to him back. So I'm sure it's. Well, a it bit goes of both, it so. goes both ways. <laughs> like years ago, I reached out to him and I was like, dude, I want a wallet. Yeah. And I want to send you my logo. Never heard back. Then he reached out to me. He's like, this is like two years later. He's like, dude, send me that logo. I'll make you a wallet. Oh. And then two years later, I'm like, oh, shit, dude. Let me <laughs> send you that logo. So also that brings me into this. So uh, Kara sent you guys a care package. They machined this pen holder. Oh, oh with, yeah. With the oil and whiskey logo on it. Damn. Nice. That is sick. Oh, that'll be perfect. You know. And that's way I'd better than your mug. Yeah, <laughs> you way better. There. That's, I love it. And then uh, there's three pens. Well, one for each. Other. One of them's different, so you'll have to fight over the different one. I want the knurled one. Yep. So. <laughs> Dude, those are sick. Yeah. So uh, Billy and Billy uh, at and Tommy at Karis Customs sent you guys that. Oh, and then you'll have to fight killer. over that. <laughs> Love it. Oh, I didn't know that holder was coming because they when I was there uh, <clears throat> for BSF's corporate sales meeting. Um, you know, they they were like, oh, here, just take them a couple of pens. And the next thing I know, they're like, hey, when are you going on the podcast? And so that met me in B- at BBT's, and they had uh, shipped it up for you. And they had so red. Guys, so. No, that's, that's wow. great. We've talked about it a few times. It's like the original uh, pen that Rick from Bear gave us is about the only thing I've, like, kept in yeah. my possession for any length of time. And then just got a new one from uh, from Tommy. Is that over Scottsdale? Yeah. Bear yeah, Tommy's such a good dude. But, yeah. Yep. Just, yeah, awesome pens, killer machine work, just does some really bad stuff. That's quite the haul we've got that here. Yeah. we got to so, have you on more often. Well, I, have, yeah. I have a lot of friends. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing is, like, I may not get any money, but people give me stuff. Right. I don't <laughs> think people, like, understand the value in a badass pen. Oh, yeah. Like the, the I think we need, to do, we need to do a collab somehow with. Yeah. Well, if you look at their page yeah. on Instagram, all the cool, like, the books they have, like, they do, like, these little books that matches the pens <clears> and stuff like that. And so. You think anybody would. would Want to buy like a oil and whiskey Karas Edition. pen or something like that? A I don't know why edition? any That's of their nice. pens are badass. Cause like, like even one. as cool as my pen is yeah, with all cool. the, like the Mexican blanket that styling on it, like you go on their page, like they have engraved stuff. I mean, they have so many cool pens. It's not even funny. That thing is, I have the worst, yeah, hand, right. I have the worst handwriting on the planet. And then they send me that. And I was like, well, at least you got to fake it. Like you look like you know how to use a pen. <laughs> yeah. Mine's not legible. Well, that's either, why but. when I got here, you guys didn't see it, but Phil was with me, but they sent one for uh, Chris as well. So Chris got this badass purple screw top oh, pen sick. and stuff like that. I almost saved it for in here, but I didn't know if I'd see him in the morning. So, <laughs> and then, um, so you guys always ask a question when you do on the movies, you go, uh, everybody goes American graffiti and you mm-hmm. always go Milner or Falfa. Yep. Well, no, it's the Pharaoh's Mercury for me. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So, it's, but when it comes to movies, I hey, see those Karis's page there, you know, Gil Gonzalez. Uh, uh-uh. no, <laughs> I might. I don't know. <laughs> Dude, that's Gil Gonzalez's car. You got your butt. Oh, is it really? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Gil Gonzalez. I forgot that. Yeah, like, see how they do those cool pens and. Yeah, that's, that's that's legit. Legit. yeah. 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 All that, like, as cool as mine is, like, some of that stuff's even cool. Like, even, like, look how badass that is. It's like, you don't even think about how cool it is to everyday carry a pen, but their pens are awesome. So, yeah. like, even, like, if you look at that one, we we're looking at the gold one, like, they have them where, like, see how it has the old school. Like looks like you're gonna write calligraphy with it. Yeah. You yeah. can change those pens out to either be ballpoint or that calligraphy style pen. You gotta dip those suckers in ink like that. Is that how that? No, works? they actually so they have ink. Feet. They have ink for them. Yeah, look at that one. So that middle, the middle picture that you're on right there, right below the mini truck, like that's one of the, they're, that, that's them at display at a car at a pen show. It's like yeah. I didn't even know there was pen shows, but like when you go when you go to Karis, it's a legit uh, machine shop. And uh, I first met them. They made uh, iPhone cases. Really? And they were all like brass and all this other stuff. And so that's when I first met them. And, um, and of course, now there's 10 million phone cases. And nobody wants to spend money on phone cases. So they started making more pens and the pens of. Did they the pen do those market. little leather books as well? I believe so. They used to, no, not making fun. Remember, you told me stories about you used to turn pens. Yeah, this that was actually how, like, the very first thing I ever made, what got me into, like, probably, I don't know, working with my hands as a young kid, my dad bought me a little lathe and I started making pens on it. And that's like all I do. Nice. Just made like pens after pens after pens. Yeah, they're, they're just general good people. Yeah, check out everybody that's listening. Check out Karis Pen Company. K-A-R-A-S. 
That's that stuff's sick there. Too. Yeah, it's that like Karis Pen C O V two because their <clears throat> main page got hacked. Yeah, some cool shit. Yep. Really yeah, really cool. They're, they're, they're good better. dudes. But so for movies, uh, I nominate. This will be one you haven't had. Of course, uh, when it comes to cars, Cobra. And I oh, know you guys yes. talked about that the other day. But there's a movie called <laughs> yes. Highballing. This was my movie as a kid. So it was Jerry Reed as a truck driver, and Peter Fonda was in it. And Look, uh, how do I had never heard of this? And <laughs> so this was my movie. And, it, and for a while, it was free on Amazon. And uh, I freaking love that movie. Highballing. But uh, you know, I grew like go to images. Yeah. So like. Basically, they're chasing Jerry Reed's the truck driver in this, and they're chasing him. And basically, it looks like the BJ and the Bear uh, semi. And uh, it has this one scene where, like, they get to an overpass and the truck's too tall, so they let the air out of the tires, then drive under the overpass. And like, when you get to be an adult, you're like, yeah, that doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> but like, it's just one of those movies. But Peter Fonda's in it as a badass that rides a motorcycle, of course. And uh, but yeah, so it has all those like old school square body pickup trucks in it. There's a lot of that. I'm going to have to check out highballing. Yeah. It's, it's dumb. right up my era. It's dumb, but it's like from that whole era of Hooper and all that stuff. As a kid, I was like, that was the movie that had me on. I was on the edge of my seat like I was watching Star Wars, but it was just like a trucker movie. <laughs> hey, what was the one where all the trucks, you're at a truck stop and then all the Maximum trucks. Overdrive. Oh, Maximum yeah. Overdrive. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's still a great movie. <laughs> yeah, my son yeah. loves it. He's like, infatu- really? Oh. He's infatuated with all the stuff I watched when Good. I was a kid. So absolutely Love like Flight of the Navigator, Maximum Flight Overdrive, of the, Navigator was the dirt amazing. bike, the dirt bike kid. I was in this restaurant in Nashville the other day, and my wife loves all those old era movies. And uh, there's a taco place there called the Red Headed Stranger in Nashville. It's amazing. And I take a picture of the bar, and then it's just a scene from a movie on the screen. And she goes, "Cool, they're watching Willow on the TV." <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> "Oh shit, that is Willow." <laughs> I was like, "But that's like my wife's. Like if you, if you had her on a podcast, she's like, oh, like." Uh, Willow or something like that. That would be one of the. Can, can we pull up? We need two pictures. Number one, Marion Cabretti from Cobra. Yep. Just Cobra's to show, so legit. just to show everybody how fucking badass Stallone was in that yep. movie. Why does? And then mean? the Mercury, of course. Oh yeah. Why don't? Dude, there's, there's a so lot of many, people don't know. That. If you watch that movie, there's so many bad different angles of that it, that Mercury jump and stuff and getting told. You could tell it got totaled when as, it landed. As this a, is who you make fun oh, of me all the time. This is who you want to be. Yeah, as an eight <laughs> to nine, eight to nine, ten year old boy to right now. <laughs> I can't tell you how many pairs of those sunglasses I made my parents buy me. You remember More that? or less than I, Brian. I used to rock those things is back in the day because I. Oh man, was he badass? You just need the matchstick. I might start I wearing that. Because right. what, do you, what else yeah. would you use a matchstick for? Is that like yeah. a you might as well. flame coming out of the top well, of the I was gun? Wondering that damn right I'm it sure is. I'm sure that's a laser pointer, but. Yeah, hell yeah, it's he's a flame. Got, he's got to light that match somehow. Yeah. <laughs> now, pull up the Mercury that he drove, too. That's the thing. That's another one that didn't age well. When you when you get into cars and you start getting a really good Mercury's, then you look yeah. at the Cobra Mercury and you're like. Oh, well, that, that <laughs> like, <laughs> like boss hood scoop on it. Yeah. But it worked. Somehow it worked. Did it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> was you, his license plate awesome 50, or is this a uh, uh, recreation? I think that's There's from the movies up there on the top middle. Up there. <clears throat> it says, all, oh, that's a car. Yeah, that doesn't age well. It just need, it's like everything else, just need to be lower. <laughs> yeah, and Stallone said Why doesn't that. the Cannonball Run get more love, movie-wise? So Did I, that not do it for you? No, I, I love that movie, and especially for cars and uh wasn't the second one though where the girl unzipped her suit and then she that, that would wind up being a woman cop and goes get a license in there somewhere that was first I think was, was that the, the first, first one? one yeah I couldn't remember that was the you first know watch you need one. to give Cannonball Run yeah Cannonball Run's legit yeah I've seen it so it was all the it's all the movie. Gator line of movies with yeah Burt Gator Reynolds was too. good yeah Gator what was it White Lightning was the first one all those Burt Reynolds movies it's like you can't go wrong with any of them the Cannonball Run with Mel Tillis oh yeah because he stutters and dude that Hawaiian Tropic car. And that movie was my favorite yeah. car in that. I'll have to then go you back got, and watch it again. You got uh, the uh, square body dually that yeah. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Terry, Terry Bradshaw is driving. Yeah, yeah, yep. And dude, I'm telling you. Yeah, somebody recreated nothing. that. It was an LST a couple years ago. There was one that looked really? exactly like it was bagged. And it was like, uh, oh, it was so badass. It's nothing but one liners the whole movie. It was so funny when yeah. I was a kid, you know, how you always, whatever movie or TV show, like you would play that character. And even after smoking a bandit, I always wanted to be Jerry Reed in the movie. So I was like, I always yeah. played the side. Snowman was like, I was yeah. never Burt Reynolds. 
But then we did. I did have one neighbor that always like he was Farrah Fawcett. <laughs> like he wanted, and then you realize later on, you're like, oh, yeah, I know what he wanted to do. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, so he, he was trying to do weird stuff. Popular yeah, he then. really he watched Falcon Crest and all those other shows. While we're watching Eighteen. That's oh, that's yeah. why I watched uh, Fall Guy. Yeah, she was in Fall Guy. Yeah, dude. If you look at the picture of her, even just in regular clothes, like with the sidekick dude up a little bit. Like, so see the picture of the three of them. Go up one more, and then go up one more. One more. Right there. Like just her and just like jeans yeah. and a dress shirt. It's like it's going on. the the yeah. opening song. It doesn't oh, yeah. get any better than yeah. the opening song. Yeah, that was the only Waylon Jennings song I didn't like. Was the song from the Dukes of Hazard. Yeah, the old boys. <laughs> really? Yeah, that's. I think the uh, the the remake of Dukes of Hazard with Johnny Knoxville is underrated. It's pretty good. The drift scene around the circle yeah. in Atlanta is pretty good because that's a uh, Reese Millen I think driving the car and drafting around the corner. She and I think, I think that's she underrated. she aged well. I know. Yeah. Wonder if she yeah, could better. have her on the podcast. I, mean, just, I don't think, think you'd be able to. Talk. Dude, that could be, be like, like Chris Farley. Like, remember that time yeah. you were with Colt Seaver uh, in the cool. train? Even her. <laughs> that's probably like 1999, though. She's <clears> probably. <throat> that's a six million dollar man. That truck was so awesome when I was a kid, though. Do you ever remember the one from Chips too? There was the blue truck. Yeah, with the that was bars. Uh, not. Uh, it was. Yeah, it was the blonde haired John's. John's truck. Yeah, And then also the power wagon from Simon and Simon around in the back. Remember the power wagon from Simon, Simon and Simon? Simon. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, I've honestly I watched way too much TV. Ne- never kid, seen the Fall Guy. You haven't? Nope. It's on no. net. I think it's on. Uh, it's on uh, Amazon Prime now. Is it really? Yep. Yeah, oh. I just saw it the other day. Look at that truck. That's, 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 that's exactly daily. how. Oh, I wish. So JC's truck, the High Plains Drifter, has that look because of me watching that show as a kid. I'm telling you what, it's one of the it. It is an amazing show. Well, the thing, <laughs> dude, I mean, listen, dude, it's Dog the Bounty Hunter for, before Dog the Bounty yeah, Hunter. Yeah, get the premise. So, first of all, he's driving this truck all the time. That truck is a, is a superhero. Basically, the show's about that. That truck can do anything. Is it like all Kit, the, though? No, like, it's, no it's, it doesn't have no. Knight Rider powers. It doesn't have, well, no, but okay. it can't talk. It's, it, no, it can't talk and it can't drive itself. It's Other than that, badass. it can do everything. But he is a stunt driver, a stunt man. Sorry, okay. stunt man for, for pet profession and he's also a bounty hunter so he's doing stunts for the movies and he's also you know hunting guys down hmm. yeah it's i'm telling you what he could kick chuck norris's ass oh, really oh yeah that's a yeah that's a bold statement he, yeah yeah he could that's because chuck was too busy doing lone wolf mcquade to be in <laughs> the fall guy that's another good one talk about a good uh truck in that lone wolf mcquade he had a i think that was a bronco in that one or blazer that was a blazer lifted blazer in that well, John, it's been awesome. Oh, it's been a pleasure. I know I was all over the place. <laughs> no, I think that's great. Yeah, yeah we got stuff, the story, dude. and sometimes it's just about the conversation. I was glad to bring Truck Stop Treasures back to oh, you. Oh, you did. I, I you reinvigorated that. I that one. You brought that back. I think you so. ended it with that yeah. as well, because yeah, I don't know if that could be up. You set yeah. the bar. I mean, it's something to shoot for now. Yep. Yeah, when you start. That should, more guests should bring Truck Stop Treasures. Yep. Honestly. Well, the thing is, is like, uh, like if I flew here to be on the podcast, I could, <laughs> like I, my wife was like, you have to bail you out. <laughs> so my wife was like, can you go into Chicago with that? And I was like, sure. In it's a, a man, slingshot. Yeah, yeah, it's a slingshot. You, that might be illegal. How, how long is the uh, band on it? <laughs> I think we got, <laughs> we got, think we got a, know what the yeah, there's a, hey, we got an eight inch limit in Chicago. That's just For a slingshot. That, yeah. That's going to have too many feet Those aren't brass second. knuckles. Those are a hold. It's a yeah. Hold. That's a slingshot. Hold. That's a handle. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, John, it's been great. No, it's been a Appreciate pleasure. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Oil & Whiskey Podcast with Roadster Shop, an Ironclad original. If you like the show, be sure to leave us a rating and review. Thanks again to our guest, John Jackson. We'll see you again next week. Mm-hmm.